Welcome to the One Up Years show, everybody, for Friday, November the 14th. This is Garnet Lee, and with me is a somnambulant John Davison who's just gone. I don't gone. have ever heard anyone use that word out loud, but I thought people <laughs> only wrote that word. <laughs> oh, no, we don't, we don't just write the words here. We use them in everyday diction. It's fantastic stuff. Anyway, next to him is Dave Ellis here. Big fun, super fun. Or are you just subdued fun? Tonight. Are you are you dropping the fun moniker? I apparently well, have no fun. But we're, we're like bummed out today. What's going on? No, it's just it's just a long week and busy time of year for everybody. So. All right, so there you go. And hey, Shane's over in Europe. He's checking out Killzone. And uh, oh, he had to go to Europe for that. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunate for him. I mean, we saw it anyway, last night at the Sony event. <laughs> <laughs> it was just down the street. <laughs> uh, anyway, and then we, so we have uh, Felinda Marco here from GayGamer.net to join us. He's been playing games, and well, you know. First Hello. couple of times you've been on the show, you had a great time, so we just thought you'd have you back. Yes, I'm very glad to be back. Thank you. All right, so there we go. We had a good time last week, and I think we're going to keep going with this plan for at least the next few weeks of games, games, and more games. The plan so, is to keep having fun. Yeah, the plan is to keep having fun. That's <laughs> what blended. Planned fun. <laughs> Jolly good. Wow, I just Carry on. <laughs> totally didn't make the fun or fun's mom joke. <laughs> Keeping it classy. Keeping it classy. Yes, I'm keeping it classy today. Anyway, we're also in the eighth floor uh, pseudo studio the now. The hot box. Yeah, it's kind of, it is a little, yeah. So we have sound insulation for up here. It's going to be really echoey because so far the sound insulation is stacked I was going to say, corner. we have sound insulation sitting on the ground. <laughs> yes, well, the one corner is very well insulated. It's it true. Is. We should all project our voices over there. So anyway, back to what we're doing the show. We're going to keep doing the uh, What You've Been Playing in two segments. I have today uh, some Left for Dead feedback from the forums and also some uh, Mirror's Edge feedback. And I know you are even, John, you've been playing yep. some Mirror's Edge. So we got that. And then we have news. News is, of course, dominated by the NPDs at the beginning. Um, and then we've got some more stuff on uh, secondhand games being uh, bad for the business from Mike Caps. What else we got in here? Um, Sony deleting content from Little Big Planet. We're going to talk about that some. And Rare deciding to fix the banjo stuff. Anyway, let's get rolling. Who's going to start? Where are we going to... Well, we should pick up some of the conversations from last week. I know Flynn specifically said he wanted to talk about Fallout 3. Okay. So let's talk about Fallout 3 first because, I mean, we didn't love it enough. Let's love on it some more. <laughs> you said game of the year. Well, I'm, just, I'm saying for now. That's my, like, right now, that is the game that keeps drawing me back. That's the game that, like, if I'm, like, have a spare minute, I'm like, oh, God, you know, got to go get to the next place, got to go explode the next guy's head into a, you know, a flood of guts and so eyeballs. How, how far into it are you? Well, I, I actually played it once through already. Oh, wow. And wow. Well, well, the thing was, I was, of course, I was re playing it for review, right. so I was like, okay, well, I'll follow the main quest. And, and I have to say, if there was any complaint I had about the game is that I was surprised when it ended like yeah, it's kind it of like, abrupt like, oh oh wait okay i didn't i mean it was epic and all but i didn't realize God, suddenly God, it was undressing. it's hot in here <laughs> it's freaking hot man so take off hot. all your clothes you know just because i'm here <laughs> oh, <laughs> you gotta be doing that kind of crazy stuff okay. uh, but uh yeah anyway, Ain't nobody the, thinks i'm handsome anyways <laughs> don't worry about it be like oh my god put that back on oh well I, I, I probably shouldn't make it. I can say that now. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, I think I'm going to blush. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, I've, I've just, it's the game I keep coming back to. And I really, I'm really enjoying it. And I, so I played through the first time. And then I got through it and I realized, you know, I, like, I, I actually like looked at the map and I was like, you know, I didn't even get to probably two thirds of, you know, what else is out there. Like, I didn't do a lot of overland traveling and going to the real far parts of the map. So now I'm playing it again. Playing it as a as a different character different style and, and you know like i'm enjoying the replay so it's so cool. what i found with it and I'm, I'm not sure if this is a bad thing or a, but i i'm um i don't have enough time to get really absorbed into it so yeah. like i get home i'm pretty late right now because we're, we're working a lot because it's the crazy season i want to play fallout and i'll play for about an hour before i'm dozing off and I'm finding that it's not because of the game. It's just become exhausted. But an hour is not enough for Fallout to sink its hooks into you. And Because uh, I remember with Oblivion, I got like this, where it was like, you need a prolonged period of time so you can see a quest line. Oh, yeah. It's entire. You need the... the, the so I'm at the point now where I'm, I'm on Ribbit City and I'm looking for the rogue android. Oh, yeah. And I think the story is really interesting. Mm-hmm. But I'm at a point where I know I have probably have to leave Rivet City and go sort of wander around or something to find him. And 
I'm sort of I'm, I sort of got to a point. Where I'm like, well, I'm going to be playing for hours, and I'm not. I'm, so I'm, you brought this I'm up gonna last do it week. next time. <laughs> you brought, this is where we left off the conversation last week, and I'm, and I want to get Flynn's input on this because what confused me about you saying that is that you loved Oblivion. You loved. Oblivion. Oh, I do, and I love Fallout. But what I'm finding is that right now, my personal time management ability <laughs> is not is not compatible with the requirements of Fallout uh-huh. Three. So. I know that I need to be able to devote at least two hours at a time I agree. to Fallout. I, I agree with you. Because a lot of these quests, I'm losing the dramatic Im- and the emotional impact of them because I'm breaking them up. Okay. Yeah. Right. And I think you need, you need to take each one of these quest lines and, and complete it before you turn it off. And I'm just, I, right now, I just don't have the time for that. And I have a feeling that a lot of the other slow burn games that, that I want to play, like Fable and Far Cry, and where there's long sort of prolonged gameplay objectives yeah, yeah. right it's going to be next year before i can play them <laughs> properly i it, think it's interesting you bring up fable 2 because for me personally i felt like fable 2 is easier to play in smaller chunks than fallout is i yeah. agree with that too absolutely well, the breadcrumb thing i mean i played yeah. some more fable 2 and i have to say that especially with a lot of games i'm balancing out coming back to the game i thought i thought the breadcrumb thing was great when i was just going to side quests <laughs> but coming back to the game after not be, having played it for about five days and then just being able to pick it up and immediately look at my quest log see what I'm working on, turn the brightness up on the breadcrumbs and go, okay, here's where I need to go, it was really nice to be able to just jump back into the game and start playing it So again. in Fallout, well, I've, I've been kind of fascinated by all the relationship things that it does. Like, this person's got the hots for this one, but he doesn't love her. And, like, there's a lot of that. Oh, the priest guy. Yeah. <laughs> there's the priest guy on Rivet City, and there's another There's another couple somewhere else that you kind of... And you get the you get sort of really embroiled in these little John, interpersonal... there's a whole bunch of Japanese dating sims that are waiting to be... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not the dating. It's just the... the no! The, the way no. the game is trying to weave these they don't knock dependencies the on each other. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of, uh, like, little minor side quests that i've been on where you where you find like notes from people to other people and you follow that and then later on you find their dead body somewhere and you know like it's like it all links up and actually it took me playing through it the second time to recognize some of those relationships i was like oh wait a minute this is the dead body of the guy whose note i found in that town like (laughs) you know five hours ago or whatever and i just think that's really cool yeah and for me like going back to oblivion versus fallout uh Back when I was playing Oblivion, I didn't play a lot of multiplayer games. And I feel like gaming in general is taking a shift towards pushing co-op gameplay, pushing multiplayer. Absolutely. And I find that's that those are the games I've drawn to most these days. And I feel like because I'm used to having like an, a kind of a social interaction with other people on playing games, when I'm playing a game like Fallout or even Fable 2, it's harder for me to play them for long periods of time because I'm missing that interaction with other people. Hmm. <laughs> And uh, I can see that. yeah, and I'm, I'm and the NPCs aren't aren't interactive enough at this stage, right? And, and I will say one of the things of Fable Two that I think helped out with that was just seeing the orbs of people that are also playing Fable Two, and then being able to talk to them and interact. Like somehow that helped kind of stymie that because I could I could have that social interaction if I wanted to it if not I could just concentrate on quests well you de- I would definitely say you have to be like for something this kind of goes along with what you both were saying but like for like if I'm going to sit down and have a fallout session I have to be in the mindset of okay I'm going to be in a uh, you know a lonely kind of space like by myself a lot because mm-hmm. that really that's one thing that I really love about fallout it may it gives you that feeling of just complete solitude like yeah. there's nothing like there'll be stretches where you're just walking forever and there's nothing around and like no people and it does a, it does a really good this job is like a it. really interesting like tip of a discussion about like what frame of mind you get in before you start to even play a game so you're saying you know like like it's not just a, a i need to block out amount of time to do it like you're talking about more than just blocking out time you're talking about like i'm going to be in a certain set of mind a super frame of re- certain frame of reference to sit down and enjoy this material and if i'm not in that then i might you know it might be a totally different other game that i'd be interested in playing oh yeah i feel I, that's how that's actually a lot of how my gaming goes i mean there were several times right when i first got the game i was like oh and then tonight when i get home and i'll play fallout and then i get home and i'm like oh you know i just don't really feel i don't know if i'm ready for that like <laughs> i think i, mean, I need it's oppressive a little bit lighter. it is a bit of a downer <laughs> in general i mean well, it's nuclear just... apocalypse generally is <laughs> <laughs> But I appreciate it for that. Yeah, you know, it's like, I, like, like there are other games I appreciate for being upbeat and fun. But I appreciate it for that 
just complete barren solitude. And just need to watch a little more Doctor Strange Love. Well, you know, well, you know the other thing too is I, I know a lot of people have complained that they don't like the you know the humor is not the same from the original games, and you know there's not as many references. And I beg to differ because there's just there's loads if you know where to. I mean, like if you look like just like quest names and people characters names, and I mean just there's so throwaway much. lines of dialogue. It's like this classic sci-fi lines and stuff will start popping up. And, and I got I gotta say my very favorite thing to listen to on the radio is the um the radio sh- the radio play herbert daring dashwood and his <laughs> yeah. stalwart manservant ghoul argyle <laughs> so awesome. and, and you can meet him in real life and actually yes, in you can. the game and yeah, they'll yeah. talk to him and he'll regale you with stories and how they messed with the show and yeah you haven't t- yeah they uh, no, I, haven't had ch- I honestly have not had much chance to play fallout 3 it's on my i'm really looking forward to it list well there's a couple of radio shows that you can or like radio stations you can tune into and one of them uh, plays and plays music, but then also plays a show, this like radio show, and it's like the adventures of Herbert Daring Dashwood, and he and his it's sidekick cool is a ghoul manservant named Argyle. Yeah, and it, they go, have adventures. It's awesome. It's you can kinda, follow the whole story. It's kind of awesome. Yeah, I actually, yeah. <laughs> I actually found that, like, that that worked really well for me because uh, I was reading a book when I started out Fallout uh, called The Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, a uh-huh. uh, novel from a couple years ago, and it takes place in like 30s, 40s, and 50s pulp comics kind of thing, and it totally evokes. That same kind of emotion, and it's really oh, yeah. funny. And they do the whole, you know, they do the, the whole voices. Everyone <laughs> talks like this. You know, it's very nineteen yeah. forties yeah, sure. radio. It was great. Although I had to, actually, I guess I do have another complaint. Is I wish they would have optioned more music for the, especially the the radio station that plays all the nineteen forties music, which I love, and yeah. I love going through and like blowing stuff up to the Andrew Sisters. Like that's awesome. <laughs> but like, I just wish there were more because I've heard the same you know ten songs over and over, and I'm kind of like, oh, okay, time to shut the radio off. But that's nice because then you can shut it off. Yeah, which is good. All right, so I think Fallout is definitely like I thought you were chilling on it some last week, but I guess what I was misinterpreting is that you're not chilling on it. It's more that uh, it's more that you I, don't have the I, time. Yeah, in the I want, space right I now want the the bandwidth to get into it because I feel like I'm spoiling it for myself by my own behavior. You know, how did you play Oblivion in in much longer period? So like, what was I, different? Hmm? One up, one up just wasn't that hard to run. Now you got a real job. <laughs> <laughs> um, didn't Oblivion, did Oblivion come out this time of year? It, it came well, there out was in like March. Year, or it was April. like a summer game, like yeah, a spring yeah. game, right? Yeah. So when I and got then I played Oblivion in summer, so there was Oblivion and then nothing. So I think. So that's a good point. It managed to actually sit on your shelf for a long time, or sit on in your shelf, you know, in yeah. your unit for a long time, and being being played without competition. Whereas now the competition's brutal. Well, it's brutal, but I also think that this is a game that because you know I think a lot of times working in the the industry we. Uh, overlook the fact that not everybody runs out and buys a game on the very first day. That's like right. we get them, you know, early for review or we look at them or we get them the day they come out or, you know, and the, and the hardcores do the same thing, but you're the general public, you know, Dude, they'll wait. Good, even, they you know, even the core gamer, because we got a good reminder of that last week's show, because we started off talking about Gears and Resistance and they had just come out that week and there were a lot of people who were like, hey, what are you doing? We just got the game. Don't, you know, don't go this far into the game yet. We want to play, play the game some. Yeah, there's a, I mean, uh, so, you you know, I think that like Fallout is a a great game to fill the you know the late winter, early spring when there's like nothing you know there's not a whole lot going on. Yeah. So I mean, I look forward to having like this you know I have a whole little library of things that I like looked at and like reviewed and you know just barreled through for the purpose of review and I'm setting them aside to really devote some time to them once there's you yeah. know. Flynn, did you check out Fable Two at all? Oh yeah, I'm a big Fable fan. I'm a huge Fable fan. But I've I had like I finished it like. Like, well, you know, because I got the, a review copy, so I finished it long before, you know, I just... So, so how would you stack it up against... How would you stack up the two against one another? Because I went back to Fable 2, and I haven't really gotten to Fallout 3, but I went back to Fable 2 somewhere the last week, and I was really enjoying it. I realized, you know what, it wasn't just a, a game that I initially sat down and enjoyed. It was a game I can go back to now and say, you know what, I'm still really having a good time with this game. Oh, yeah, I loved it. I loved it, and I will go back and play it again. And I think that it's interesting because the the games themselves are so similar in some ways and yet so completely different in other ways you know like yeah. especially like the graphic look of the game okay you've got like fallout which is very you know like 
limited color palette and he's destroyed and wrecked and then you've got on the opposite side you've got fable which is so lush and flowers and plants and trees and everything's you know very you know rich colored costumes and you know towns and stuff and then you've got um and then you've got the similar thing like i actually want to do uh like i want to take a poll on like the dogs like the versus <laughs> like the fable 2 dog versus the the fallout dog because i actually think the fable 2 dog is better yeah I, fable I 2 totally dog is awesome well, yeah. but, but it's a different mechanic. It's a, it is it, a different it is. mechanic. I mean, it's a, you're intended to have the Fable 2 dog throughout, whereas Fallout 3, it's one of those things you can come across or you cannot even yeah, find it. Yeah, the first it. time I played it through, I never even found the dog. Yeah. But, but I remember back when like back when they were first showing it at E3, that was something they were really pushing. Oh, and then you have this dog. And then I thought it was going to be along the lines of the Fable dog, like this constant companion. But I actually found the dog to be a bit of a hindrance after a while. In, in Fallout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, one but, of I love things, it, but I love it in Fable. One of the things that strikes me in going back to Fable 2 this week and playing it some is that it's a very, and this is a weird word, but it's a very breakable game. It's a game that if you, it, you do sort of, like we were talking, that's one of the reasons I was catching what you are saying about going into the game with the right mindset. Mm -hmm. If you go into Fable 2 to play the game and get out of it what it wants to give you, then you'll play a game and probably have a good time with it. But it's very breakable. If you go into it and just go through the central quest, you're going to finish the game very quickly. You're not going to get a lot out of it. You're going to be like, wow. That was very shallow. There wasn't a lot to it. It looks like the last game. I don't get it. It wasn't very good. And if you go through it trying to just do the open world part, mm -hmm. then, I mean, I was, watching, uh, I was watching the Zero Punctuation Review today, and, and I was thinking to myself, Yahtzee, you're like, you're, you're going from one, you're swinging from one extreme to the other. You know, it's like, it's not The Sims. And yeah, just going and getting married and cranking out kids is not the fun part. It's like, part of it is that you go in, enjoy, enjoy the world for being a more rich and dynamic world in which you have lots of other stories taking place. I don't know. I mean, I was able to get right back into it. I mean, I think that those complaints are valid, and it is very breakable. And if you go into it in those mindsets, it will break on you. Right, I, think I think it's more liable to break than Fallout 3 is. I think it's one of those games where the pieces don't necessarily stand up so well on their own, but when you combine them as an entire package, an entire experience, the game works so much yeah, better that way. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's, thank you. That was a better way of putting what I was trying to say. I lo yeah, I really, really liked Fable 2. I thought it was, you know... It was amazing. I'm curious to see what you think when you get when you get to play a job. I have not even unwrapped it. Yet. <laughs> I know, I know, it's still sitting there. It was it's, I got that in, fa in Fallout, and it was just like I went straight to Fallout. It's a, definitely a different experience, but at the same time, they really do have so, like the core. It's like some of the core mechanics of the games are very, very similar. Which parts? Well, which I parts? I mean, what parts stood out to you like that? Well, just like uh, I mean, obviously, like you do a bit more. It's a, a little bit more heavier on the like the character customizing in Fallout than it is in uh, you know than it is in uh, Fable. But you still get to. I mean, you can still do you know it's like there's change your appearance. Yeah, you can change your appearance. There's different things you can. I mean, like even in Fallout, you can get haircuts. You can get your hair changed. You can go like I had this like my second <laughs> character that I played was a girl, and when I went to Ten Penny Tower, I like bought a little frock for her and like, wore it in, <laughs> so people would be nice to me. My, my <laughs> did that work? Yeah, it did. My first character when I stepped out of the vault at age 19 looked like John McCain, complete with white comb over. <laughs> <laughs> It was pretty ridiculous. You're such a Republican. <laughs> it was pretty ridiculous. <laughs> but I, uh, th th yeah, there's just some, you know, and then you've got the dog thing. And while the mechanic is different, you still have that. And actually through in Fallout, you have several opportunities to bring on people. Yeah. And you can actually have the dog and someone else. Like you can have like a, almost like a three person party. Really? I didn't know that mm -hmm. part. That's kind of cool. Yeah. So. so does the dog do anything useful? Yeah, you can send it. finds it treasure for you. you. Oh, wait, wrong game. <laughs> well, no, that's the thing. You can. You can send it to find ammo, food, oh, never yeah. mind. <laughs> or medicine, and you can tell it which one you want to find. Now, with, see, now with Fable, it's random. Like, the dog right. just finds it and tells you. And this one, you're like, okay, go find me ammo, or go find me medicine. And the dog will run and go find, yeah, whatever it is that you're looking oh, for. Cool. And it'll help you fight, also. Fallout 3 has to, Search Dog 2.0. But you have to dog find eight. dog before you can use him, right? Yeah, you have to find the dog. In Fable, you automatically get the dog. Right. In, uh, in Fallout, it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's an side quest. Yeah. yeah, an optional side quest. Oh, okay. <clears throat> All right, so what have you unwrapped him in playing then, John? Well, for work, I was playing the, the Clone Wars games. Oh, the one with the lightsaber action. The Wii one, I wasn't, I could take it or leave it, the fighting one, but the DS one's pretty good. Well, that was a, you took it or left it pretty quickly there. I don't yeah. think you. I don't think you were taking shit. I think you were more like I could just leave it and be done with it, and that's that. <laughs> there was no taking there I mean, at all. It's, it's 
it's interesting the whole idea of of taking a fighting game and and making it not dependent on button mashing. Basically. But ultimately, you're just kind of flailing around. You are just flailing around. It's, I'm going to say you're not making again. You're not making it sound interesting. But anyway, I didn't really spend much time <laughs> with that, but I did spend a lot of time with with Jedi Alliance, which is a pretty competent knockoff of uh, Ninja Gaiden Dragon Sword with Star Wars characters. And this where does that leave it? the John Davison Star Wars games <laughs> minute. <laughs> it's good. Well, the other people like that game. Uh, Anthony Gallegos was playing it. He, he liked it a lot, it's like, actually. I mean, it's all stylus-based. Um, the only thing you hold a button for is to use a force power, and you rarely use that. So it's all it's it's just like Dragon Sword, where you move around a 3D environment. The graphics are comparable to a PS1 game, at least, maybe better. So to be clear, it's a knockoff of the engine. I mean, they didn't actually license that. Oh, no, no. But it's okay. it's a very competent knockoff. You don't hold that. a book style, do you? No. Yeah, that's that's another difference. Um, it's all, it has, I'm all about book style with the It has quick time events and puzzles. and I mean, it, it's, it's a very large, very competent adventure on DS. And they've used, you know, voice talent, graphic. And that's another thing that has very 1940s style voiceover. I don't know if the TV show does, but... When you went, and now as we go to the Jedi Alliance, <laughs> throw, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, that kind of makes sense. Star Wars has always supposed to have been kind of a serialized, like, adventure right. series, so. But it's, it's really well done on the DS. So I've been playing that, and then, um, I think the other sort of big game that, that really grabbed me and, and surprised me, it was Mirror's Edge. All right, so let's do some Mirror's Edge. I, got, I actually have I have a, a significant amount of response from the boards already because people a lot of people were anxious for this game, um, and Cygnus X eighty nine was one of the first people to chime in and said they'd actually he's like not only that I've beaten the games I beat the game a few hours ago I must say the overall experience was very satisfying, definitely up there with the top games I played this generation. I don't feel my long wait time for the game was in vain. I thought I would be, I thought I would feel it eventually, but I never got the sense of repetitiveness. I beat the game without shooting anyone, which made it a hard experience. And and I'm now going through it with a gun, so I wonder how easy the game will be then. Here's the pros: uh, Faith is the protagonist. She's not a faceless character as with most first-person games. The gameplay, and I think it means the mechanics of uh, parkouring, because he says not in combat. The sound, the graphics, the trial mode, the cons are the combat, unfortunately, and the trial and error can get frustrating at times, and then the neutral stuff, um, the story, which he didn't think was as bad as many of the reviewers have said, just kind of average, and then the fact that it's rather short. So there, that's a first, there's your first thumbnail sketch. Yeah, of I mean, what I found was, the, I, the, my, content, my personal context was, it was, should I play Fallout tonight or should I put Mirror's Edge in? And I put Mirror's Edge in and there was this sort of like wave of almost relief came over me as I was playing it because it's it's such a, it's different, a pretty different environment. It's a yeah. different environment and I think it's the first game that I remember playing in a very long time that there are that it, there's a physical response to it like in terms of the the excitement and the and the tension and the the feeling of sort of kind of vertigo-ish kind of feeling but that that notion of when you when, when you know a path across some buildings and you nail it first time and she just keeps going and going and going and doesn't mess up it's it's really exciting and you can you feel it in a way that a lot of games don't do that to you and i think some of it is the i think that the unsung hero of the whole game is the camera because what they did is they put the camera in her uh, what is essentially in her eyes instead of her head Okay, how so? So the view, um, the, your view of everything is always based on... So you know, you know why, uh, why roller, coaster, roller coasters are scary, even if you're watching a video of them? Is that if they, if they do it, in the, if they, if they uh, mimic the way that you behave on a roller coaster, it's not, what you're, it's not the actual path. It's you're looking at what's about to happen. And that's the that's the truly scary part of it is that you're anticipating what's about to happen in a couple of seconds. Okay. So if you if you put a camera on someone's head or you know or you track their eyes when they're roller coaster, when they come up to a bend or they're going over over the top of something, they're always looking ahead. And what Mirror's Edge seems to do is simulate that so that as you're doing something, she's she's leading you towards whatever the next thing is. And you know it's never just a fixed view forward. And the way that everything is just very fluid, there's no. You don't have that sort of really rigid first-person 
camera feeling and the fact that you do catch glimpses of her body, there's a sense of self in the game. That I will agree with from the limited amount of time I played with it was that you really had a much more natural sense of, of the way you had a point of view and whether it was just the body or what you're, I mean, I didn't think about it in terms of what you're thinking of. I didn't think it out to the point of, oh, it's like it's in her eyes, but it does make sense. I mean, well, and a, and a main difference is most first person games, specifically shooters, the camera's not in their head or eyes. It's actually usually placed in, like, sort of in the chest, chest yeah. Yeah. so that the gun is like the only thing you kind of see. And this, it moves it up and it changes your whole perspective and movement in the and world the, around the you. The first time you pull off a slide under something, you completely get a sense of, of, of her in her entirety because the way that it handles her body sliding out in front of it, it feels very much like sliding. And then there's some parts later on where you're on these skyscrapers with these long sloping glass roofs and the only way off is to leap over the rail and just slide down them. And the way that it handles her sort of arms and legs flailing around and you just catch glimpses of them that it, it doesn't linger on anything long enough for you to go, oh, that looks kind of lame. It just gives you like a snap of a hand coming into view or whatever. Like she's clearly a little out of control and it works so well. And like, you know, there's uh, the, some of the stuff with the, the combat really, you have to, the game is all about avoiding combat really. And I think that's where they put a lot of the energy. So the disarming and stuff, you'll see a, grab onto a weapon and flick and like flick a guy back but it's all momentum based so if you're running forward and you catch a guy the combat is much more satisfactory if you're sort of running past somebody and happen to glance them as opposed to stopping and engage if you stop and engage them it's it's a lot less rewarding well that's interesting you brought that up because chris noted that uh, so his overall view was that there's a great idea is given so-so treatment, but he's specifically about momentum. Says momentum can kill combat. If I'm running at a cop and I attack, even if my hit connects, I still frequently end up sliding right off of him. And by the time we both recover, he's shooting me in the back. Generally, when two moving people collide, they you know stop and they don't slip right past each other unless they're covered in Crisco. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't. I disagree that it works like that because I mean, one thing if there's a guy and he's already pulled his gun on you, the first thing you need to do is to you can slow down her rate the 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 time, the reaction times increase. So if you want to disarm and actually catch it, because basically the, the... The gun the, turns red. The gun turns red when you can grab it. So if you can, if you have her, whatever it is, acuity or whatever, tuned up to be able to see that, you can slow down time with the X button and you you, you hit the, whatever the grab key is. It's Y, I think. Yeah, and she'll, she'll grab the weapon and then she'll use her momentum to flick, flip the guy or throw him or crush him against something. So, and also you, very often if there's a guy, if you run straight at them, I mean, the best possible thing to do is you can, you can use your slide move and take their legs out. Yeah. And then very often the best thing to do then is just to get up and just keep running because that's what the game really wants you to, it doesn't really want you to fight. And, you know, if you, if you say, oh, even when you get a gun, it's like, it feels, it feels wrong in this game. It's like, and very often she'll like crack off a couple of shots and as you run off, she'll throw it away. Because she's not about the guns. Because right? she really because isn't like, about the guns. I mean, and, and again, that was my complaint from just having seen it as demos, was if you're going to give me a gun, your gun, gun play has to be better than that. Right, those. but very often what they, you know, there's because you start to learn the environments, and in a weird kind of way, it reminded me of Portal. Hmm. Well, I don't think there's anything weird about that, and I'll tell you, and I'm, I'm going to jump they're, ahead. Because they're gigantic spatial reasoning puzzles, uh -huh. and particularly if you turn the red off. Oh, yeah, no, that's by, that, now you're talking about... Did you, by the way, how easy is it to find the different paths? Like, so supposedly when they were talking about it, they'd be like, oh, well, you know, there's going to be three paths. there be like an easy path. Uh -huh. There'll be like a mid-level path. And there'll be like an expert path you'll really have to look to find. And some of them you'll initially think is there, there's a leap of faith. No pun intended, but there are some parts... No, I think they actually fully intended you to say that. Well, way to fall into the PR plan. But <laughs> there, are, there are parts of it where the only... You know, if you have the red turned on, you'll be standing on a ledge and you'll see a red door. Like, it looks basically like it's across the street. And you're like, there's no way in hell she's going to make that. And you try jumping off different things and climbing up things and jumping off them and try and find every interaction point. And then... You sort of forget that she has certain abilities. So one of the things she can do is she can tuck herself up when she jumps to get over things or to extend her jump. So if you hold down one button, she lifts her legs up and it kind of propels her forward. So if you like, you basically have to run off the building and hit the jump button. So she's like pushing herself off the side and then she lifts her legs up and you can make these really long jumps. And when you And she always just barely makes them. So she'll like cling on to like something that's sticking out of the side of the building, which doesn't turn red until you're in midair. Oh, and, and suddenly you're like, 
oh, fuck, next time I do that, I need to make sure I'm holding down the button so she'll reach out and grab. Because if you're not holding down the bumper or whatever mm-hmm. to grab on, she won't try and grab. And then the sense of falling is fucking unreal. Like, you really get a... Because like, it's, like, really, really fast, and you see her hands flapping around, and it all goes really dark. And there's a real... And the, the way the sound and the camera and everything works is it, it really feels like you're falling off a building. And I don't think many games have, have captured... No, that I, kind no, of I sense of motion the same actually, way. One of the things that I forget who I was talking about the other day about this game, one of the things they brought out was how amazingly like white knuckled it was when you made those jumps and how you really bought into it and you were like, oh my God, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know if it. And then when you did make it, it was like, oh shit, thank God. I but it, it. it is a very different game if you turn the red off because you start to explore the environment a lot more. And something that happens with the combat is because the red almost gives you tunnel vision because you start looking for it. Well, sure. Because so, that's the path. I mean, it's and like, then you the always path. know that you know if there's a couple of planks of wood sticking off the side of a wall, then I'm going to have to jump off that, and that's the way to do it. But what you what you start doing when you turn it off, particularly with the combat, is if they're near a wall, you'll wall run, and you, okay. you tend to not do that. And if you wall run, you can flip, and you can again, you can use momentum, and you can take them down almost by clipping them. So it has it, it has a bit of portal in the way you have to be like really aware of the entire environment. Because you you have to make use of all the surfaces, and then the other thing it reminds me of is is the first Prince of Persia. Huh. The you know first that 3D one, the first 3D one, the right, first yeah, Ubisoft, the, and that sense of kind of abandon that you had to have in Prince of Persia, where you're like, I'm just going to go for it. I don't know if it's the right thing to do, but I'm going to try and run along this wall and hope I can get to the other side. Right. Well, I mean, like when you got to the birdcage section, when you get yeah. to, like we were like, okay. Well, imagine that section, and the whole game is like that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Except I mean, it you don't to have the like, rewind mechanic yeah. the champ Prince Persia. You just have to reload it. So that sense of almost of it being exhausting from like the te- like, it's. I mean, it's broken up into chapters and there's the, and the storyline kind of unfolds through the audio or whatever. But it breaks it up into these nice little chunks where you're just by the end of it, you suddenly realize that you're like. <gasps> <sighs> okay, I can relax now. It sounds like to me, and I, and this would make sense actually if you think if you follow the line of reasoning that it you fall more into the character in the world by turning off the red, and of course that makes sense because the red is a you know like is it just a, a synthetic thing you're adding on on top to make mm-hmm. it a game. If you turn that off, then you really get more caught up in it. You start playing the you start playing Faith more as Faith and not just a game yeah. character. One thing I would ask is the fact that there's little to no like humans outside of enemies and yourself and your friends. Does that affect your appreciation for the game specifically? the mall level the fact that there's no one else around yeah i mean it feels pretty i mean like the it but i mean it's obviously it's a hyper realistic kind of stylized thing anyway so it sort of makes sense and it just puts it it puts references to people in so there's the whole thing about the you know the the mayoral thing and you know there's some stuff that goes on with the story and yeah faith's relatives and her friends and the way it draws in so it, it, it keeps it very focused on stuff that matters to her and in a lot of ways it's like that it's like the first matrix movie in the way that it it sort of like tunes everything else out and it just focuses on on the main characters and in fact there's some parts with the dialogue where it's almost like it reminds me a little bit of the you know get to the phone parts in in the matrix right oh that's cool that's a good analogy i like that. they're like giving you directions yeah because you're getting this okay you got to go around here and you got to turn right and then you got to you know that's cool. and it's and it, it, it the the vibe is very much like the chase scenes in the matrix where they you know where they have the cell phones and they're telling them where to get to the exit point let me give you a few more comments. Uh, so the rest of Chris's comments, real quickly, where he said, the father I got in the game, where I'd find the usual bullshit you find in games with environmental interactions, magic spots that don't work. Um, also said, not to mention the number of times I ground to a halt because the desk I was vaulting off of had a computer monitor on it. Seriously, I can't overcome a computer monitor or a cardboard box or some other little object. Um, said, stop making me stop. Stop making me turn valves to shut off steam and water. Stop making me sit in elevators. Stop making me push buttons. This is a game about movement, so stop making me stop. But I think the the stop points are usually to give you a breather. Okay. They seem to be paced out so that it's like they'll give you a period where you learn. I mean, there is a lot of trial and error to it. But once you, you get the hang of the environment, there'll be a period where you're just like, oh, my God, I was just like running for five minutes straight. And then it'll say, okay, now get in the elevator and press the button. You've got like 15 seconds to catch your breath before we make <laughs> you do the next thing. Um. SD Woodchuck said, my biggest complaint with the game is that the combat is clunky and in some cases completely nonsensical. That aside, the movement controls are spot on, awesome, and the layout, uh, uh, the layouts, which I think he means the levels, are very fun to navigate. I'm having a lot of fun with it. 
Um, and then a couple of overview comments. Crazy screenwriter. Uh, like, uh, I laughed at first, but then I read the rest of the paragraph, and it actually makes a lot of sense. He says, um, as far as I can tell, most reviews are bullshit, which is what made me laugh. But then I like this part. He says, and seem to be more from a perspective of, we want a game that works like this instead of taking it or leaving it on its own merits. Also, a certain amount of, this game does things differently, and I don't understand it, therefore this game is terrible. Which, I mean, I'm curious, how much do you think people will respond to it like that, that aren't just hardcore? I don't know. I mean, I think there's always the risk of people looking at a game the way they thought it was supposed to be, as opposed to the way that it is. I mean, it definitely isn't what I specifically thought it was going to be. Well, okay. Just from reading, I mean, just from reading the early cover, I mean, I very consciously kept away from a, a lot of the stuff, because it... What did you think it might be, and where did it wind up that's different? Um... I think I mean like there's there's a vibe to it that's that's kind of different. Um, the I mean my my first exposure to it was when you remember when Edge did that original cover story, yeah. the interview with Dice, and that, that was, was cool. it was a very you know real shoot for the moon interview. You know like and it was at the point where they were still we're just going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing until until it breaks basically. And it was it was really refreshing to see that they had a team within Dice that was doing something like that where they were like we're going to break all the conventions of a first person game and try something different and I think you know it, it is rooted in convention it's just got a very nice front end on it um, but I wasn't I wasn't expecting the the the, the Prince of Persianness specifically hmm so Count Zero Interrupt sort of summed it up like this. It says, for me, this game feels like a proof of concept. I'm looking forward to the sequel when they can take the excellent core controls and mechanics and put them into a more solidly designed, more substantial game. How, I mean, how does that sum that up for you? Do you feel the same? Is it nah. more than proof of concept? I really like the whole universe. I mean, I think they've, they've realized a really compelling game world and you know, started touching on a mythology. And I mean, we talked about this a few weeks ago. And there's so much that they could do with this game world. With diff- you know, they could do with something from the opposite. The first obvious thing to do is to do the game from the opposite side. Is there so much there that someone's going to try and pick it up and maybe movie option it? I mean, is it something you see turning into a movie? Because to me, it originally looked like Ultraviolet. I mean, you guys seen you guys seen right mm-hmm. with a little with a little run low love run maybe in it. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah. <coughs> Did you see the 2D game? The t- the oh, the I Flash s- one? Yeah. yeah. I yeah. saw a news story about it. I was like, wow, okay. So tell me, have you checked it out? Yeah, I mean, it's they've taken the gameplay structure and even the, even the moves that she has and turned them into a 2D... Flash game. Rotos- and it looks... And it's like sort of that rotoscope animation style from the original Prince of Persia, and they've applied that. And, and when you see it in 2D, actually, the Prince of Persia connections, come to think of it, they, they are a lot more apparent... Well, that would make sense, sure, because you have the same roots back to 2D. Yeah. It makes sense. Well, I guess before we leave and take a quick break, since we're talking about realized game worlds, maybe I should like eat my first dose of crow on Quantum of Solace, which I played over the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like it now? Uh, quite. He liked it before. Oh, well, you ate some crow last God. week, don't forget. Oh, I, yeah. Well, I ate crow. I hadn't tried it yet. I mean, that was sort of the, like, you're going to have to eat crow because the reviews are in and they're bad. and. I, I, I hate to say it. I mean, I, and I have a cop, copy of World at War on my desk now. And this is like this whole, like, A, I'm starting to get shooter fatigue. I am actually starting to get shooter fatigue mm-hmm. as much as I like shooters. Mm-hmm. You, you feeling it too, Flynn? I, well, I always feel it. <laughs> yeah. That's a consistent. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a constant for me. But, I mean, there's certain ones I like, obviously. I'm loving Fallout, and there's definitely shoot, lots of shooting in that. But Well, I do enjoy a good shooter. So, I mean, it's that, that I'm getting shooter fatigue, A, tells you something about how much it has been, and B, sort of like how, like, none of them. I mean, so far I haven't had the one this fall. Well, we're talking about Left 4 Dead. I was going to say. We're talk about Left 4 Dead oh, after oh, yeah. break. But I, you know what? I'm not going to classify that exactly as a shooter. Because it's got so much other stuff going on, but we'll get to that, in a, and we'll get to that in a little bit. The the thing about Quantum of Solace is, and we were joking about this um, because we were talking about the review, and our review said that it was like uh, Goldeneye. Goldeneye. Yeah, and I said that. Well, here's here's for me the reason I think that there'll be people who look at it, and whether they can put their hands on it or not. I think that some of the things that will make them think about Goldeneye are that it traces the movie, or it traces a movie style of presentation really closely. In that, you really get a sense of. Have you ever read a script and you know you're like, yeah, okay, uh, act one, scene one, act one, scene two, act one, scene three, close. Mm-hmm. And you really get that sense playing the levels here. It's like you come to a space, you run through your you run through your scenes in the act, and when it's done and complete, you pick up and you move on to the next place. And Is it, that bad? 
I mean, I think that would describe a lot of games. That's, I, mean, I mean, that's how so, Tomb Raider. Yeah, very much how, like that. how so is this different? Interesting. You know what? It is very much like Tomb Raider. And so I'll say then I guess it's a matter of how well orchestrated. So are you it, responding to what your expectation of it was then? <laughs> I mean, ser- I'm serious. I mean, I'm being, you know, no, I, res- I reserve that. No, no, I played this on 360. I only do that to PS3 games. <laughs> 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 nice. Um, well, I mean, I think that I think my point that I'm trying to make, and I guess I'm not articulating it well, is that is that the levels feel shorter. And, and again, it's like resistance levels felt short. Shit, they're they're eons long. Just to, to paraphrase you from July, yeah, <laughs> you said it's Call of Duty Four with James Bond in it. Yeah, well, it's Call of Duty Four with James Bond in it. Well, yeah, it is sort of that. I mean, except that that <laughs> that sounds good. Call, Call of Duty. I'd play that. Let, let's put it this way: it starts out and has like some cool parts, and then very quickly the 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 game gets very. It feels very generic. It just feels really, really generic, and you don't feel like Bond. You know what you feel like? You feel like. Yeah, I almost kind of think that like it's the way a Jason Bourne movie game should have been. Like, uh, like hmm. except that Jason Bourne, I guess, doesn't shoot that much. I mean, it's very. Um, I mean, the guy, like, maybe it's more like, it's almost like Jason Stratham. He's, like, blowing the shit out of everything. He's, like, Mr. Gun Guy. And I realize that part of this also is that the new Bond is less gadgety. He's a tougher, so, harder so guy. So put, put yourself in a different frame of mind. Take you take out of out of Garnet Video Gamer and into Garnet. I just got an Xbox 360 arcade for, yeah, cri- yeah. for Christmas, and we went to see Quantum of Solace and really liked it. Yeah, I mean... <sighs> Well, I haven't. I don't know how much of the movie it's spoiling. It's kind of odd because I, I had this expectation from having the way they described it that the game was going to be uh, the you know two movies combined. There was kind of be this overarching story, and instead it picks up right at the end of Casino Royale. I mean, I thought it was going to be sort of a, a, a stitched together narrative, but it's more of a. It picks up at the end with Mr. White. You have you have a scene there. You have another scene. You have another scene, and then you do like some flashbacks that go back into some of the uh, Casino Royale airtime, and it's I don't know. Just does it I, just feel it, generic. It, it's just, it does really just sort of feel generic, and and it just doesn't. It, it's not worried. It I don't know, man. It's just not connecting with me. No? It's not connecting with me as well as I had hoped it would. The shooting action is good. The cover mechanic, actually, the cover mechanic is good. But the, I mean, I guess it's just that, like, like, part of it is the parts that aren't in the game are just in this flat, like, you're looking at the, you're looking at your laptop screen and, and monitoring a satellite feed, and it's like, oh, here's someone, of, a picture of, of M, and you're talking to her, and, and here's a, a data feed from a folder on some bad guy, and you just, I'm not getting that emotion, emotional immersion in the Bond character or the Bond world. What I would ask is one of the things that I always enjoy about the Bond movies is you're traveling all over the world, these beautiful environments amazing places and people like how are the environments how are the set pieces in this game there that, that that's actually really there, there's a really really cool um rooftop scramble and shooting chase and i guess it's through like it's like i, I, you know, I didn't really note the location it's like barcelona like sort of I, mean, I don't know if it, it's not barcelona it's smaller but it's like you know a, like an italian uh 15th century city where you're busting through buildings and barcelona, running across rooftops hmm? barcelona's not Oh, Barcelona's in Spain. No, I say, but that's why I switch. No, I said Barcelona. <laughs> Barcelona is in Spain. Yes. He means vaguely European. It, yeah, that's I, the <laughs> southern part. They all speak foreign. <laughs> <laughs> they put a lot of tomato in stuff, right? <laughs> Cheese. Well, okay. yeah, olive oil. I said everywhere. Barcelona and realized that I was a fucking retard, idiot, for saying Barcelona. Because Barcelona <laughs> is big, and it wasn't the sort of look, actually, that I was thinking of. And then I was like, okay. Okay, well, I'll just switch this to Italy. No one will notice. And you notice. That's great. <laughs> it Thanks. sounds like you're saying it's more like a Renaissance era village. Like, yeah, 15th century. Or yeah. So. Like, you know, yeah, 15th century sort of village where you're running through you know, a lot of stone A lot stuff, of hills. A lot of piazzas mm-hmm. and stuff where you're running through and you bust through. Uh, uh, like, well, there's different pathways and stuff. But you know what was cool? Um, what was the Bond game that had... It was one of the EA ones, and there was one where I thought they were actually going to get shit right, where they had the Bond moments, you know? Mm-hmm. You'd have, like, the 007 thing that came up. That was the one where they had an original story, and it was, like, a whole kind of movie, right? Is that the one that had the running down the dam minigame? Yes. 
It was. And when you did something, when you did something right or whatever, when you did something Bond like, you got the, you know, you got like the 007 flash over your head, and it's mm-hmm. like a Bond moment. Like I, like cheesy <laughs> as that was, and it was hella cheesy. <laughs> was, was I had no was, argument. Was the world is not enough a movie, or was that the game? That was the follow up to Goldeneye. Um, that wasn't quite the follow up to Goldeneye. Okay. Like a lot of driving sequences and some generic first person shooter stuff. Well, anyway. I think it needs a little more Bond mystique. And does it have? Did that, it has Daniel Craig's likeness. Does it have his voice as well? Yeah, yeah. No, the, the voiceover, yeah. the voiceover work is great. And as a matter of fact, the likeness of Daniel Craig is still like fun, spitting image, like really. But he has really a very cra- sort of yeah. well, craggy, right. bony face. And he has a lot of perfect normal video game graphics. Face. He has that super tight, you know, that very Abs. tight, tightly yeah, cropped love it. <laughs> hair. <laughs> I'd play. <it>. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I mean, I keep playing it. It's just, I don't know. It just Maybe I'm too demanding now. It's going to be like, oh, Garnet, he's like become jaded. He's too demanding now. But I don't think. I mean, I have great things to say about Left 4 Dead. I thought that was really fun. So I don't think I'm too. Maybe we should take a break and then come back. And... Yeah, I think we have more. a lot to talk about Left 4 Dead. Played, I also played multiplayer of Quantum of Solace. And I really think people are going to be like kind of blobbed by that. Cause it's, it's... I don't even understand why they even bothered. <laughs> Well, because that was one of the because they, because they wanted to pick up the Golden Eye vibe, and everybody but, like back you know, in the day played four. John player and I were talking Eye. about this the other day. Go back and play Golden Eye. It's not that good. It's a product of its times. It doesn't live up. Like just make a good shooter. It doesn't have to be Golden Eye. And I think that's the problem. A lot of the Bond people. It's a problem with a lot of shooters. I think there's a lot of shooters that you know there is. When you think about it, there's no way in hell it's going to develop an, an online community. I mean, like the Darkness was like this. <laughs> oh, you know. Yeah. It's like, why did it have an online? Because, you know, and you start to think, well, it had an online mode because reviewers would have bitched and whined about it if it didn't. True that? Some would. I wouldn't say everyone would, but some would. Yeah. I mean, Uh, if you complain about, and I'm not comparing the two games by any stretch, but if if anyone complained about Bioshock didn't have multiplayer, you have no business reviewing games in the first place. Oh, oh, they did. They did in the beginning. Before the game came out, everybody's like, ah, it's it's a single player experience. See, and I'm getting to a point where, like, just don't bother. Just put more effort into the single player. Make it more a full, fleshed out experience. Give me more content in single player. Right. Um, all right. I, I will never make that complaint in a review. So I hope to God I don't know if I do call me out on it. And right, when we come back on the other side of the break, we'll get into this subject because we'll talk about resistance to multiplayer. Since we talked about single player last week, we'll talk about Left 4 Dead, and then I guess we have some gears for two. Gears for two. Gears for, oh, gears for two. Gears for two. Uh-huh. Was that gears for two? Table seven. Gears for two. <laughs> it does have co-ops, so there you go. Stick around. We'll be right back. We're back, and we're going to jump right into the Resistance 2 because last week I went on the single-player rant, and this week I might actually go on a rant the other way because co-op multiplayer in the game. Did anyone say anything about how upset you got? Well, well, you went purple. Yes. Your heart yes. monitor went off, too. I was worried for a second there. <laughs> there were the veins in your neck were sticking out. <laughs> Did it yeah, I got really upset about it. You know what? I haven't changed my mind about single-player. I mean, it's still... Yeah. Did anyone from Insomniac say anything to you? No. Any old friends or anything? Actually, they didn't. I, they're just not speaking might, to you I anymore. I guess they're not speaking to you. <laughs> I don't think they're is, listening to the podcast anymore. Probably not. Which is shame. Which is, anyway, regardless of all that, <laughs> co-op, co-op multiplayer is actually really cool. And it's a whole game in and of itself. Yep. But that's where, like, my one, if I'm going to get the complaint out early this time, my complaint would be that I don't know that making a really, really fucking awesome and cool multiplayer co-op game and a pretty cool uh, multiplayer online shooter that's, you know, competitive and a single-player game was the best route to go for this sequel because... So let me ask you this. The single-player really did suffer on account of Might it have been point. better served by not having a single-player game at all? Well, but... Going the Warhawk group. Uh, yeah. May, well, yeah, maybe, but I don't know that. I mean, did it have to be Resistance Two? Maybe, maybe Resistance Two could have come at another time, and they could have built the game. I, that I don't they think had. it could have. I think Insomniac was under a lot of pressure to follow up Resistance One with something more. All right. Well, and I, mean, I think it, probably they set the bar a little too high. Okay. So how about this? The, the co-op, the co-op multiplayer is. Have you played the co-op multiplayer? Has anybody else played it besides <laughs> David? 
No. Have you played it? Okay, so co-op multiplayer is really, really cool because it is it is a series of... It, it's not just independent missions, but it's independent missions that are dynamically changing based on how well you're playing the game, what rank the people you're playing it with. So, it, it, like, we're... I mean, we're going to talk about... So if, the, I, if I went home and played it, I wouldn't have the same experience that you had with it? Not necessarily. You wouldn't. Ha- you would specifically would not have the same objectives in the mm-hmm. same order that I have. Even if we so play. So how does the same it mix? Area. Is it just go here and kill this, or is it get it's more just, elaborate than that? Well, I mean, a lot of it has to do with blow this up, turn this switch off. I mean, most of it's kind of basic. Stop these guys from getting in this attack. Flicking switches. <laughs> My God. <laughs> I know it's uh, it's some compelling gameplay right there. Mm. Are there any blocks I can push? Yes. Excellent. No, not really. Um, and it also scales depending on how many people are in your right. co-op party. So the actual environment will scale larger or smaller depending on how many zero or one to eight players you have playing okay. co-op. I'd say that like the thing that it does right and the thing that matches up really well with Resistance 2 is it really boils down the essence of what they've done to the mechanics of the guns mm-hmm. because you really, really have to work together with the three guys. I mean, we t- I talked about it last week a bit, little bit like being instanced uh, World of Warcraft. Jesus, dude, that that was so spot on. I mean, that's what this game is. You get together your group and it's like your raiding party and you go and raid these instances and the instances are the levels and they sort of change depending on how well you're doing or what's going on and who's hosting because there are actually there are actually paths through the levels, I guess, that depending on who's hosting, if they've already done objective A, B, and C, then they get D, E, and F or something. Right, and it's nice that you can be playing with a split party so that if you're a lower level, you can play with some higher level people and play and access uh, options you wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, so I, I really, I mean, I think that if you have a, P, like, like, so one of the questions that came up after the show was like, so if I have a PS3 and I haven't bought this game yet, should I get it? I mean, I think the answer is, are you going to play it online? Because yeah. if you're going to play it online, you really, really, really want the game because the online is really, really awesome, except for the fact that even with a party system, working inside the PlayStation Network and it's on a not, PS3 game. The, you know what? It's not a PlayStation Network only thing because Gears, I'm having serious issues with its online multiplayer. All right. It's matchmaking So you were talking about this, but, but getting to together is not a problem the other night me and and jose and uh and danny and jeff want to get together and play right. co-op right and like no matter how fucking times jose sends me the invite to his party i'd get the little email and it would pop up and say an email so i'd go out you know like not want the email but like a message right i'd go hit the message but unlike live i guess there's no button there to join the party so i guess you're just supposed to know okay then i go join his party but then i go no I mean, there's, his- they're supposed to be like so how are you supposed to find the party if it doesn't I link you to it? I don't know. Did you did you try just pulling up your friends list and yes. seeing if it was joinable? It, it was not letting me join it, okay. but he had it set to where I should have been able to join what, it. What I'm curious about, I wonder if it was a firewall issue, because we've run into some issues even with Gears where people will have a strict firwall versus an uh, open firewall. Oh, you mean like maybe Jose was... Bo- be, yeah. We could I, play... I, I would try it with a different host before making a final uh, termination on it. But that like, would be really weird, because we're able to play live games just fine. I mean, we connect just fine over a lot. But I mean, you get different games, different protocols, maybe it's different ports, I yeah. don't know. But when, once you get in it, like it's a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. And, and like, you can play for a couple hours going through all the different co-op stuff. Um, I, I, and I'm sorry that I bitched once upon a time about uh, Bluetooth headsets and PS3 because <laughs> I added, I, I went and got like just a plain Bluetooth, like a twenty dollars Bluetooth headset, mm-hmm. and gave it to my PS. Well, gave it to my PS3. I put it, you, know, <laughs> you gave it to your PS3. <laughs> gave, it to you gave it to your PS3. I came home and said, "I was under the impression you it. didn't have that kind of relationship with your PS3." I came home and said, "Baby, it's the power of Blu-ray." Baby, I got a headset for you. <laughs> and she said, "Oh, oh, sink me." Awkward. <laughs> I'm a little uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so I yeah, so I got a I got a headset. Why are you taking your pants off now, Garnet? Jesus Christ. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, I got one dedicated just for that, and it's not bad. But, I mean, really, Sony does need to kind of I'm losing track. We're kind of okay with it then, right? I like the multiplayer co-op. I've been consistent all along. Yeah, the the co-op is great. The competitive, I would say... The deathmatch is the weakest of the competitive multiplayer, I think. Yeah, yeah, it really does. It suffers from... Is that because it just doesn't lend itself to a free-for-all structure? Yeah, it, it, it can... It can be disorienting and frustrating. And like, if you're the one getting a bunch of the kills, it's a lot of fun. It, as it is the problem. It's the map design. The map design does not lend itself well to that sort of game mechanic because there's so many open vistas and it's just not controlled well that too often you die and you don't know what the hell happened. Kind of like Quake Wars. 
Yes. Well, yeah, Quake Wars does have that, except the Quake Wars, it, Quake Wars when it's working, you're, it, it, like this is why the objective mode works. It, you, when you're working towards an objective, you at least know that you're headed one direction. As long as the other team's playing that way, you can at least say, okay, well, they're probably defending from over here, or they're defending from over here, or someone's covering you, and they say, hey, this, this guy's over here flanking us, and they just knocked you off, and we, when we come back, we got to go get them. Which, Whereas, what game did that really well? Frontlines. Was it Frontlines? Yeah, Frontlines really actually well? does yeah. work really well with that, yeah. yeah. Whereas, whereas when you're playing in Deathmatch, uh, uh, even in team deathmatch, I mean, you're just all running around, right? Well, and, and I guess a part of it is also the fact that you know, the objective-based stuff, you're so focused on your location things, you're trying to take it, and then you're like anti-squad, the squad that's kind of your nemesis. Yeah. You can run across other enemies, guy, other enemy guys, so it's not... It's not uh, it's it's not unusual to just run past another enemy guy and not even bother shooting at him because you know it's just going to affect you trying to get there and he's trying to get his own spot. So you're not trying to get slowed down, right? Exactly. I haven't seen that happen, but that's funny. I could so totally is it see two that. factions or is are there multiple factions in the world? Well, there's basically two sides. Yeah. You know, Chimera and Human, but each uh, side has its own sub squads, and you basically have a squad on the opposite side that's your like nemesis, and you'll be sent to the same areas each time. And to they're try to take they're locations. identified specifically in the HUD or whatever that they're the ones you need to go not after. really no. but they ju- you just kind of no, the ones you're targeting are. right you just kind of naturally end up in the same areas oh okay uh it, it just i don't know it just really works well, it's because it's because the game's managed with an objective system so mm-hmm. when you're joining a 60 player objective uh, the objective based game then you're placed in a squad your squad's given an objective it's marked on your hud it's uh, you know here's your oh, start it's like go to this town and liberate whatever right you know? something go, like that. go to this reactor and defend it go to this point and blow up this this whatever switch mm-hmm. <laughs> make it a switch <laughs> and then while you're being tasked to go and blow up that switch the other team your, your nemesis squad is being tasked to go and defend the switch oh, so it's dynamically pairing you off exactly. against an, uh, essentially pairing off groups of what eight within the eight 64? at a time and then, it, then it'll change the mix some so it may say that like your team is your squad is beating the crap out of a squad that's not quite as good mm-hmm. so then it'll so task what, so it'll task what? another squad to come and support that squad i was just going to ask why are the 64 people then so there's 60 people, A, to give it a sense of scale. And so they one. could write 64 players on the box? And <laughs> it's 60. No, because they also then are able to bring together different combinations. So there are times when they'll bring together a big great group in a firefight because everyone will suddenly be tasked with objectives in the same spot. And, and I'll say, like, one of the reasons I would say the 60 player works is one thing you kind of touched on but didn't really go into is the fact that if you get stuck against a squad that's far superior to you, the next time you'll get stuck against a squad that is, a, is not doing as well either so that you'll be more evenly matched. Oh, okay. And that wouldn't work if it had a lower player so count. So had... Uh, does it handle the groups like clans so that it limit? So does it limit chat to just your group? Yes, yes, yes. And then you just get proximity chat when you're around somebody else. Yes, yeah. You're just chatting within your squad, and then if you're close to other people, you do hear them. I believe. I I don't know. I, I really only pay attention well, to the people that are in my squad. Well, I was playing early on, and so I, there wasn't a lot of chat anywhere. Other, uh, well, that, anyway, that's just, others. That's so. just a problem with PS3 stuff, right? Yeah, it's still well, a they, problem. There are a lot. That's of why that I brought up the headsets. point about the headset is that like now that Bluetooth. I mean, I guess it's not even now. Like Bluetooth cheap headsets are pretty cheap, and the fact that I can buy one at retail for 20 bucks like i'm pretty astounded actually that sony hasn't just bought an inexpensive one and dropped it in the box it really they, they need to do that well they I mean, need to do that they're not going well, to last time i they just brian, that, I mean, brian they, was like you cannot play this game without oh you can it's really annoying but there's a lot of people that do and i think that's that's also the reason you see a lot of people playing the death match still as well is that you, a don't, lot need of people you don't need to talk yeah you draw it's you, it's drop in and, and there shoot. and there are a lot of people that like the fast paced kind of arcade shooter where you don't really have to think about it and you respawn and suddenly you come back and fight some more and the berserks work really well in in multiplayer like in in the just plain competitive deathmatch multiplayer then the berserks sort of become the same as the call of duty 4 power ups mm-hmm. you know just like you get a plane after you, know, you get helicopter after we get radar after 3 and then uh, uh, helicopter after 5 and plane after 7 same thing here you get what is it six kills six or seven kills and your berserk activates and some of them are like i can absorb more damage one of them's like a better radar and you can One switch it like and you can switch your bullets. berserk after every time you die you can reload your character with different weapons different berserks every time you're spawning oh, okay so there's so. that and then the, the, a couple of that with the character developments i mean really they did crib a lot of this off of call of duty 4 but it still really works really well if you're gonna steal steal from the best like seriously why not yeah and then you have it the sounds the, cool it is yeah the multiplayer suite is really really awesome the co-op is a blast and it plays really well and it's it really plays to the strengths of the game you you're focused on the weapons you're focused on playing just the shooter part of it and, and the rest of it sort of melts away and i can really get into so it so potentially it has legs 
Oh, it has huge legs. Oh, well, the I first, think one, has great first legs. one had like really long legs. Anyways. Yeah. I mean, so I, I expect, and he's super rabid fan base. I expect and that to continue. even though the audience doesn't chat much, I mean, they, they take to multiplayer games and stick with I mean, Warhawk is still going strong. The st- yep. You can always get a really good game of Warhawk. Well, and honestly, I think the community stuff they're bringing into uh, Resistance 2 as well is just going to help further that because you'll be able to interact with people you play with outside of the game as well and mm-hmm. kind of like hook up. So I'd like to be able to connect my party easier. I'd like to be able to maintain that. I mean, so it has party system where like you pull up triangle and you can use your L1 and R1 to like switch through your friends list and invite people into parties and inform a party and then it, you know play multiplayer games together. I'd like for that to work more smoothly. And again, it goes back to the whole thing of I wish all of PlayStation Network just was unified and had like the same system and setup and everybody. Yeah, but same I, got, tags. I have to keep bringing this up though, and we'll talk about it when we're talking about Gears. Is the fact like its party systems not that great either i just okay. wish everyone rip off call of duty or halo I'm well just, halo we were talking about this like dude halo why, like bungie should just sell the halo 3 lobby and party system they're not gonna do that that's that's their golden that's egg. Their thing yeah well man they could make so much money selling that seriously are we gonna I talk think, about gears now yeah we talk about gears sure i played an hour of gears i think i played the wrong hour of gears <laughs> you know what it's it's funny because when we were playing What's it, the right hour i don't know but it's not the first hour that's for when, sure when we were when we were playing it for <laughs> review like early on like greg was sitting right next to me when we were playing and like we were giving each other looks like oh shit it's I gears 1.5 like, it, yeah it was just like where's the where's the imagination or the innovation or the you know it was like the mo- the first hour is the most utterly conventional, gorgeous looking shooter. I I couldn't agree with you more. Like totally. Like the first the first act specifically is very familiar, and I think it's probably intentional. Is because and the game never strays very far from the basic you know stop and pop whatever gameplay. Like it right. never strays too far from it, but it does give you opportunities to do things that are different. And kind of step out of the convention. And I will now use the term 10 shitloads in conversation. 10 shitloads. <laughs> it's not one shitload, it, 10 shitloads. <laughs> God, the dialogue in that game is so... Oh, it's laughable. It's... God. And for me, like, that's actually one of the things, and I've said this before, but I feel like they went the wrong tack with the story by trying to make it more serious and make you really care. I was reading Jaffe's blog earlier on, and he was, like, spooging over this, like... This Spoil it a little bit. There's a scene where uh, it all gets too much for some for one of the characters. Oh, that scene. Yeah, that scene is okay, but but he was like, um, I mean, like giddy. Like we played through that 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 specific one we're talking about. It's when you're you're trying to free some slaves. Oh god. Yeah. I think, you know, after I rail, let me tell you what. Here's the difference. I actually had an expectation for Resistance Two of coming through on story. My expectation for Gears Two was like not very high, and it still falls below that. It falls below that because of that. Because of that. <laughs> oh, oh, oh god! Oh, he's heart monitor. Monitor. heart monitor is going oh. again. <laughs> Calm down. That scene. Lusa. That that Lusa. that level. That level. The one. How do you not like that level? That you, level is garbage. You, it is you, awful. What level? Is, come on, let's, we, not, let's not it, be vague here. It's kind of a spoiler thing, and I kind of said something about last week, and I got yeah. really slammed for it. So yeah, I, I don't want to. The level that's super different that we'll just call like uh, Plat, the, the, the belly the of the beast. Yeah, like the belly of the Bowser's beast level castle is by far one of like like if i said resistance 2 was one of the poorest shooters i've played in a long time that is one of the poorest levels i think maybe it's because you're playing with me and having trouble keeping up i was oh yeah i didn't have any trouble keeping up i was right behind you as as the (laughs) stupid oh my god it's so stupid i think that level is so stupid and you're not the only one that that doesn't like that level are you talking about the worm because a lot of of people online are talking about the worm i don't i think it's i think it's safe to talk about it it's fucking dumb it's so (sighs) dumb it's so dumb and stupid such an amazing Articulate argument from you. <laughs> How, such an, have you such played, an amazingly have you articulate this? level. Flynn's been very quiet for a while. Have you played it? Uh, not yet. It's, uh, <laughs> it's in the stack of things that uh, that Fallout keeps making me play. But, but yeah, one of the things I want to hit on, and I, and I kind of, it's like I think they go the wrong way with the story. I just think they need. It's so campy, Evil Dead, ultra violent. I kind of think they should go more that route instead of trying to like make it into like some kind of political. I want Marcus to lose his hand <laughs> and attach the damn chainsaw. He's already got a chainsaw attached yeah. to his hand because he's always it's holding that damn we're gun. Ne- <laughs> we're nearly there. Yeah, seriously. Come get some. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> see, see, I agree with you. I would, I, you know, that I would. Agree and I think that level specifically works for that very because reason. The way, the way the characters run and move and the whole vibe of the game is is that is that really you know campy cartoon like 
sort of I don't know. For me, vibe. that's one specific level. Like, it, it did things differently. And I could see that if you were dying a lot, it could be very frustrating because it is somewhat trial and error. And I know some... It's just dumb, dude. It's I don't so know. I, it felt like a 3D Contra for me at the end. Really? Yeah. Really? Totally. Where, where are you... Like what? When you're attacking, sushi? like, you, well, I can't tell you specifically <laughs> because you know it kind of ruins it for people oh, who haven't played it's it. It's just bad. It, no, you know what ruined it was when they made it. That was what ruined oh, it. You are a bitter, ouch. bitter man. Nasty. That's what. That's what ruined that level was when they're like, oh, you know what, would be a really good idea. Let's do this. And then no one said, no, that's actually not a good idea. We shouldn't do that because someone should have. You know what? Ugh, you're in the minority on this one. No, right, whatever. People uh, seem to be. I mean, I was reading a bunch of stuff online, and people seem to be digging the the worm. Really? Yeah. Um, but I, I will say, dude, eat the I, worm. Whatever. A lot of what I've read is has really said that it just seems so much like the first one. I mean, like they didn't really do much to change it, or they don't seem to have. I mean, I mean, right. again, I've only played an hour of it, and it was just and like you know, know there's the on rails bit, and there's the running through the hospital, and right? The, it, it, and you, they don't, they really don't. But for me, the environments are what make the difference between it and the original gears, where you have a lot more variety in what you're doing, and specifically where you're doing. Being it. outside is nice. Well, and one of the interesting things is there are a few levels that take place kind of in caves. But none of them look alike. They all have their own unique kind of visual feel and even like f- sense of scale about them. So they all feel they different. all come from a similar vocabulary, but yes. they look different. Uh, I think that's what's really good is like th- there is certainly a graphical vocabulary of gears, and you always know you're playing gears. I mean, there's no doubt this is a gears game. I mean, it's so strong that when we looked at the last Unreal tournament, we're like, oh well, God, it looks like a fucking gears game because gears has stamped out thick that. soldiers, thick, like right. character design specifically. Yeah, like the, the way the body armor looks, the way the the way the coloring and lighting is done but in environments. Did you say it has some some of the same scenes, same levels? No, as Unreal. No, no, no. The, the Gears Two has some of the same environments as Gears One, right? No, I said a similar looking environment. Oh, okay. Specifically that first act. Yeah, it feels very much like you know, Gears like running one. through the mansion or whatever it was in the first one. It's a lot like that. You know, the one that led up to the. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't remember the name of anything. The berserker thing that you were attacking the, the, at the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there are parts that are actually really cool. I mean, like, I, I thought that some of the stuff they did, like with the collapse, mm-hmm. which people, if you played the part where the, where the big collapse, I thought that was really neat. And I think that, that the design right through that part immediately after that was pretty good because we were playing co-op mm-hmm. and we were completely split up. I mean, I'm like over here fucking around to the left and he's gone off down the center. And then To, to me, what they do so well is it's a very linear game. It is very linear. But they give you the illusion that it's more wide open. And I think that that's one of the things they definitely hit on and, and pull off very successfully in mm-hmm. this game. But, I mean, I wouldn't go into it looking for anything epic from single no, player. No pun intended. <laughs> I, wouldn't look for, I wouldn't go into it looking for anything monumental or earth-shattering for me, or, like, the single or memorable player, out of single as player. As like an entire experience. Especially like, not from the dialogue. For, as an entire experience, it's much more satisfying to me than the first game. It's also significantly longer than the first game as well. Um, and I think the difficulty is balanced really well because the fact you can play co-op against I can be playing on a hardcore Garnet can be playing on casual and uh, oh, I see what you did there that was funny that was, <laughs> that was, a, that was but, a stealth diss uh, but it's kind of not very stealthy actually it, it's kind of transparent you don't even notice um, I know uh, Alice and uh, Anthony were playing through a co-op and Alice was giving Anthony shit for dying all the time it's because he was playing on hardcore and she was playing on normal and neither of them really even noticed it until like after the fact because Anthony was like well yeah why am I dying so much and She's kicking my ass, so I think that's cool. That's kind of cool. That is cool. Do I think it's any, funny. Do we have any community comments on Gears? Um, no, I didn't bring it this time. Oh, okay. But I can guess. I mean, uh, well, if you guys want to comment on Gears, we can keep talking about Gears as long as you want to. If you have something to say to add to this conversation, just throw it in the thread for this week's show. But and well, I'll pick one of the things I do want to hit on, and I, and I talked about it earlier, is just um, I've been playing a lot of Horde, and I finally tried to play some just multiplayer, party up, and just play like normal execution wars and multiplayer stuff. And the matchmaking system is kind of borked right now. Yeah, you were telling me it like takes forever to it, get to get grouped. And up. that's actually good, feeds into one of my frustrations from the review process. Uh, when we played it for reviews, review session. We went to like a Microsoft event, and we only played it through LAN. Mm-hmm. And that's always very frustrating, especially with a game like Gears that performs so differently between LAN to online. And so in my review, I specifically mentioned the fact we only played it on LAN. So that's all I can base my review on, unfortunately. And generally, once you actually get in a game, it performs pretty well. I think the chainsaw is overpowered. Um, 
bullet lag is not nearly as big a problem as it was with the first Gears. But the fact that it takes like five or six, maybe even ten minutes sometimes to actually join a game. But you said that was going to get better, right? It should get better. I mean, Halo 3 had some problems, not nearly the same problems that Gears but 2 But it's, ma- it's mapping, it's mapping gamer tags and latency. It's, it's basically creating right a now. database of every single gamer tag. <laughs> every single gamer tag uh, uh, and basically labeling good connection, medium connection, bad connection, so that eventually, once they have this database built up, you'll be able to connect much faster because it'll be able to assign a voice host to one person, game host to another person. So besides my blood pressure getting up a little bit about single player, you know, like one thing I think that's making me not so upset about campaign is like three quarters of the campaign I played, I played co-op with David and like I brought up about Resistance 2. I think that like we said, it's like so stupid and simple, like playing with someone else makes stuff good and if resistance is to if resistance to main or what they're calling single player campaign still allowed the old fashioned style I'll call it like mm-hmm. just two people buddy playing it together I probably have, I probably wouldn't have gotten quite so upset because like there's parts of that game so far I've been playing with Dave like especially like the warming I hated which at least like at least I can talk and laugh with Dave while I'm playing through and go God this is so fucking did you, that's so stupid <laughs> yeah that's so stupid oh look oh look it's more fucking anuses from prey <laughs> <laughs> but it's also fun because you can kind of like work together like there was one point when you had the sniper yeah and I had a lancer and I could kind of shoot cover uh, cover out of people they'd pop up and then you would headshot them like just simple stuff like yeah simple stuff like that it's a lot of fun and I also think it's funny that both Resistance 2 and Gears 2 to me are made and saved by their cooperative online multiplayer modes because in Resistance 2 it's the it's the you know multi, kind of instance. Multi, it's the multi objective instance thing and in Gears 2 it's Horde man Horde is Horde's where it's at yeah. Like that's what makes that game for me. Yeah, it's surprisingly it's surprisingly good. Um, I, I'm still kind of concerned whether it'll have legs, like over the long run. You guys actually beat it. You've been so you've been through level fifty. I was yeah, I mean, and not a, on, a couple not on Weenie. You've done it on normal. We did on normal, and we're up to like forty five on hardcore. Um, so what what is Horde? Horde is you basically start on any of the multiplayer level maps, and it's you and up to four other people for a total of five players. And you have waves of locust enemies that spawn and attack you, and you have to kill them. Uh, and then it has like a certain number, and then you basically, in between rounds, you have like 15 seconds to gather ammo, and then they respawn. And, and it goes by really again. fast. You're like, you like try and run out and get ammo, and then all of a sudden it's like three, two, one. I'm like, oh shit, I need to be back up there on the ledge. Right. And, you know, as they spawn, like more and more powerful enemies start spawning. Um, you have the big boomers that are firing boom shot. You have snipers. You have flamethrower wielding bad guys. So it's a little bit like the terrorist hunt from Rainbow Six. Yeah, is really good. Yeah, way to describe it. But like, I don't know. It works better just because of the way they do it in waves, <laughs> and they give you kind of a, a chance to catch your breath uh, in between it. And it's interesting. A lot of people are playing. I'm just checking the leaderboards. I can tell a lot of people are playing the game and. And not having much of a plan and just kind of just kind of going willy-nilly and just killing things and then dying and then restarting up and going. But if you really want to go like really deep into the waves and survive a long time, you have to kind of have a plan and just stick with it and make it, make it work. Specifically, um, you can grab these shields, uh, portable shields. You can walk around and have cover, but you can plant them in the ground. So on one of the levels, day one, is at the beginning of the game, someone will grab the shield. And there are these balconies. It's basically this kind of urban environment, like intersection, four-way intersection, this big hole in the middle. And they have a movie theater and an arcade, like, across each other. And each one has kind of a balcony. If you hole up on the balcony above the movie theater, there's only one entrance to it. And you can place the shield at the bottom of the entrance, and the AI is too stupid to be able to climb over it or get past it. And it basically creates an artificial barrier they can't get through. And you guys basically just take cover up top, and you're, you're shooting enemies from every single direction. There's bullets flying from everywhere. So this is something on the same wavelength as the propane tanks and gas tanks you were setting up when you were getting ambushed and left for dead. Because because that's definitely one of the cool parts of Left 4 Dead is you can, when you, so Left 4 Dead has a strange mechanic where, it's not strange, it's actually cool. It's like when you get to certain spots within the level of the scene that you're playing, there's a trigger and the trigger is going to trade, you know, it's going to create this wave, even no matter, no matter what the AI director does, it's going to throw a huge wave of enemies at you. And a lot of times there are things that Dave was pointing out, like there'd be gas cans or propane tanks or traps, you know, you could actually set up out in the environment. So that as the waves are coming and in, they're different every advantage. time they may be there they might not be there next time you play through it but i want to get to the left for dead in a second but one thing i want to just want to say with gears is um it's shocking <laughs> I, I, like i don't 
know, it's just it's shocking. Ca- it Flynn's causes like, shout out to my kids. Much, much like Left for Dead does uh, does it even better, but it creates like a sense of, of panic. It's it, the shocker when so, well, well, eventually enemies will get to a point where they can knock the shield down and bum rush you from behind. Uh-huh. And so when you when they finally do that and really start taking you out, I don't know. It's it's really cool and it causes like a momentary panic, which not a lot of shooters do and get right. A momentary panic. Yeah, well, yeah, because ultimately then you realize, wait, I'm just playing a fucking game. What's it going to do to me? Yeah. I had plenty of... Well, there's lots of yelling outside. Crazy. GM's on deadline. I had uh, I had lots of panics, and they were longer than moments in Left 4 Dead, dude. Like, I mean, I think that's like the thing of that game is is it's a controlled controlled panic it's controlled panic throughout like the whole time it's very good at managing the tension it's very yeah. good at like pacing it down every you know giving you just a lull you know it's like i found myself last night after so we played along along a little pretty good amount of time and then i went and played some single player and i found myself like when you weren't there i would start going much more slowly mm-hmm. that's why i'd be like in office buildings and like there'd be one floor where they'd be like just coming at me from every direction and be like oh shit they're never gonna stop me. you finally get rid of them all and then like after that i'm like creeping forward going like looking around the corner Where's the next one? Where's the next one? You know, like go up to a door and be like, "Can I hear anything behind there?" No, I don't know. Is there anything back there? And then finally open the door and they're like, "Shit, there's nothing in here." And then like finally, you like the AI. We were joking about it, but like the the AI director is evil. Yeah, it's, he's, <laughs> it's evil. I'm convinced it's Gabe Newell sitting in his office 24 hours a day just fucking just with like people online. Into the game. Yeah, it's like <laughs> South Park style when they were playing WoW, just poop sucking it, <laughs> dropping zombies into everyone's game. It is evil. It's like, it, and, it, and it's bizarre because you'll make comments about it. Like we were playing No Mercy, which is the first campaign, and we were going through an area where there wasn't many zombies for a while. And Garnet said, "This is kind of boring." And literally, like five seconds oh later, a bum rush got oh sent God. at us from like every direction. We were screwed. <laughs> like, like within ten seconds, we were screwed. My favorite. There's got to be happenstance. I mean, there's no way. I mean, I don't think they put I don't, natural voice. Like, I don't think listening so. to you. I don't think so either. But there was a, the better example is I was playing with Ryan O'Donnell and Scooter and. Sharky, and we were all dead except for Ryan, and he was limping at this point because when your health drops down, your character starts visibly limping, and yeah. you can see the hurt. And he was just rushing ahead to just try to beat it. He starts yelling, "I'm gonna beat it! I'm gonna beat it!" And I was like, "Don't say it!" Oh. And the second he said it, uh, Smoker, which is this guy that shoot his tongue like from 50 right. feet away, grabs him, pulls him away. A boomer comes in, vomits on him, on him, which causes like dozens of zombies to just bum rush, and he got killed like, instantly. <laughs> oh. I was like, "You shouldn't have fucking said anything. He heard you." Yeah, I think that like like the the testament to how well the AI director part works is the fact that we think like we're like really convincing ourselves, man, this dude is like listening to us or hearing us or whatever because it really has that that pacing so well. I mean, that's why I described it like this morning when I like made a quick Twitter post about it. I was like, you know, it's like a combination of a thrill ride and a really really good haunted house, like in a really yeah. like an adult <laughs> haunted yeah. house. Yeah. Because it has that same degree of like when it jumps in your face, you Freaking jump out of your skin, and it has the pacing of a thrill ride where it's like, you know, it gets you wound up, it gets you wound up, it gets you wound up, and then it gives you a little bit of relax. So, this is a game you have to play multiplayer, right? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, as know. much as I was enjoying it with Dave, like within 30 minutes of when you got off, dude, I like tried to play single player. I was like, yeah, okay, I want to play a little yeah, like, if, you do not, if you don't have the ability to play it online, don't yeah. buy this game. Yeah, it really. Ready uh, that. It's I mean, not that it's bad, but it's just not nearly what it is. With, no, it's it's built with. for you know multiplayer. Yeah, and what I'm shocked about is how good the controls. And I've played it on PC, and it's awesome. On PC, you can tell us what it's designed for. But how well the controls like transfer over on the 360. They've really optimized it. And I really like the quick turn. The quick turn yeah. is important. You know, the funny thing is, I like the quick turn, but I hardly ever use it. Really? Be- because the way they have the sensitivity set up in the game is that your X sensitivity, which is just looking around normally, uh, is set up really high and your Y up and down is set up really low. So it's really easy to turn around amazingly fast. And I find that most of the time I, I just turn that way rather than using the quick turn. I almost kind of forget about it. Hmm. Um, but like the fact that with the pace of play, you have these zombies running off everywhere and you're having to shoot in multiple directions is how accurate, how easy it is to be accurate in the game for a console shooter. So I think between that and the AI director, like, I think I'll actually wind up playing on both platforms. I think I'll play I will it on because PC for I have some, I have some people that will only play it on PC and some people that only play it on 360. So what did you play it on? Uh, 360. I'm not a very good PC gamer. I get all you know <laughs> crazy. I'm not. The, it, I'm it, better with this, but you know, or I was making the international sign of the controller. <laughs> manual, <laughs> manual dexterity for <laughs> listeners at home. Yeah, uh, I. But I really love the. Playing as a survivor, I really don't love playing as a zombie. Yeah, 
Which sucks because that was the part I was really excited about. I, I was you like, know, I get to play a zombie that's fucking badass. And I, then, I think I think a lot of people are going to react that way because you're not spawning as just one of the normal zombies that are just running around. You you spawn as one of the four like super infected, um, and that's the hunter, which is this, you can crouch down and jump all over the place and grab people. You have the smoker that has his long tongue, grab him, pull him. You have the boomer, which is the big bloated guy who moves really slow. You can vomit and blow up on people, and that causes other zombies to hit them. And then eventually, sometimes you can spawn as the tank. Uh, and yet, it's not very fun. Well, it's, a, it's I see, but, <laughs> no, but I think you're in no be. position to make a judgment because I just hopped in the one game where it was literally me on one side and him on the other, just so he can kind of see it. That is not nearly the optimal way to play that uh, versus mode. So is it random what you spawn as? The AI director controls what you spawn as, so you don't you don't actually control that um, based on how they're moving and where when you die and where they're at in the level. It'll tell you. It'll basically say you know you're spawning as this, and then it'll actually spawn you in like kind of a spirit form right on top of where all the survivors are, and you have to run. And find a and place. Find a place to hide. Find a place where they can't spawn. see you, and you have to be a certain. You didn't like that either. Them. I, didn't, I found it irritating. What I've actually the the thing that I found the most irritating was that it takes one to two shots to take you down when yeah. you're playing a zombie. I mean, I know they were trying to balance it because, of course, when you play a survivor, once you're dead, you're dead. Like yeah. that's you're done. And then the zombies respawn. But it for I mean, first of all. You go down like that. I mean, just like two shots and you're done, and then you're respawning again, and you're waiting 15 to 20 seconds, and you got to go find another place to hide. And I found it really aggravating. Like, I how, think, how long did you play it? Uh, we played for an hour or so. Okay. Th- then you got a really good idea that you're probably not going to like playing as a zombie. Yeah, I just it was it was frustrating, and I like I don't. It was that same. Um, you know, I'll probably get, Zo- get hung for this, but I, you know, I like the part of the reason that I never liked playing Halo multiplayer was because a I suck and two, it's for frustrating. Me, all die, I was oh. doing was just getting killed and then yeah. getting killed. I was and then the same way when I first started killed. playing Halo Three. It was just like this isn't fun. I'm dead all the time. Right. Well, so and that's zombies it's like that, that same frustration level that I felt with that, and I was like, you know, zombies like that, and you don't have just a simple gun because you're not you're not a you're no, not you a have survivor. You have like your whatever your power is to attack with, and in order to be successful at it, it, it takes a good deal of finesse and patience and, and patience. It's actually you have to think much more psychologically when you're playing as a zombie. You have to play the role of the AI director. And place yourself in spots and situations where you don't think they'll expect you, uh, whether it's a blind corner that they'll just run right past. Um, so as the zombie, you know where they're trying to get. Well, yeah, I mean, it, once you learn the, the levels, the levels are pretty linear. I mean, they have a few areas where you can take multiple paths, but they all kind of funnel to one area at the end. Um, and you'll have played through because the the first stuff takes place in exact same levels as a single player. Mm-hmm. But basically, you just take the role of these super infected uh, beings. I do think it is it is is balanced in a certain way there, where I think you have to be wired a certain way to really have fun with it. The controls are kind of clunky. Uh, for each type, they don't feel really comfortable initially, and even over a period of time, you learn to get used to them. But they never quite gel perfectly to where it's just kind of natural. Right. But for me, like when you pull off something where you're coordinating with someone else, where um, I'll be a smoker and I'll reach out and grab somebody with my tongue, pull them apart. There'll be a boomer hiding behind them who vomits on the other three, so that zombies all bum rush them. And when the zombies are around you, you can't just run through them. You have to like push your way through to try to get over to where I'm slashing at the other guy. And if if it works right, they won't actually be able to get to the guy I'm slashing at. He'll be dead by the time they even get there. But, oh, but that's the thing. If it works right, <laughs> and and when you get take when you can get taken down with two shots, it never works right. And were you playing against bots or real people? Real people. Okay, because the bots are really good. The AI is really good in the game when you're playing, you know, if you're playing with two people and you have two bots, the bots are really good, and it's even more frustrating to play in versus mode when there are bots, but there are bots I think, playing as I think there'll be a survivors. Group, I think there will be a group of people that really likes playing zombie. And I'm going to be one of them. And I think, I think it'll, I think <laughs> like, it'll be a smaller, I really, it'll be a smaller group. It'll be people who are willing to put in the time to really learn it because it takes a lot of finesse. Mm-hmm. It takes a lot of learning the level and, like you said, learn, like playing it in the mindset of being the AI director, and, being and out you, there to set the You have to have somewhat of a sadistic streak to you. To really enjoy. Well, I mean, it. I don't know about that. I, mean, I don't know. It's it, when, when you're just going you know, after the survivors. You're I basically mean. just trying to be like 
I don't know. For me, I was trying to make the people I was playing against so fucking frustrated, just constantly harassing them. It wasn't even about just killing them. It was just like... So it's a griefing game? <laughs> yeah, it is. Because you have to think about it. I mean, one of the things that's really cool about the super zombies is that they all have a distinct noise that they make. And it's mm-hmm. very... Like, the positional audio in the game is phenomenal. I have a good 5.1. And you remember, like, when we were, like... We were playing just in survivor mode. I was like, dude, there's a guy behind us. And yeah. you're like, 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 dude, I didn't see him. I could hear him, like, so well in the, in the uh, speaker behind me and to the left. I knew... Yeah. Exactly where he was. So was by like, making a game where griefing is the is the gameplay model, have they made the grief proof game? No, I mean there will always be people that will just like to fuck with other people. No, because there'll be people there'll be people who ruin that mode by jumping in and not playing it right. Right, there'll be people who get on a team with survivors and then fuck over their friends. Well, and kill basically. them because it's, there's friendly fire. Yeah, there is. Oh, there yeah. is. I mean, yeah, yeah. but yeah, I know it's kind of a bummer, isn't it? Well, I, again, it's, it's... But it adds to the I franticness the, of it. Uh, I think the zombie portion of it would be great if you didn't get taken down so quickly. Like, if, if you just had a chance to survive a little bit longer that you could actually have the time to get that finesse down to pull off this, you know, those special moves. But I have a feeling they had engaging. it set like that at some point, and it just was... It was they, the zombies were too powerful. I, because the, you're, when you're if playing, you learn, if you learn, I mean, I, I could see that because once you learn the levels and you learn where to hide, and you I mean you've got a pretty good advantage if you're a zombie because you're like you've got a ton of zombies to hide within, right? So there's like all the I mean, unless you're a tank and really stand out, the others are a right. little bit more difficult to pick out. The hunter's easy because he's like a, that weird crouch. Yeah. I guess they're all somewhat easy to take out. They're all, out. They all have their own like, layer like, of distinction. But what happens is if you wait, you know, if you're patient, like you said, and you wait until like the swarm starts to hit the team, and then they're like, just because, let me tell you what, when the swarm starts coming at you, it gets hectic. It gets assholes and elbows pretty quickly, where you're like, shit, over there, over here, over there, over there. Like, if you get someone caught up in that, I think it would be pretty easy to, to catch so, them. Um, we said that you don't, you don't get to be the tank very often. At least I did. I, I don't know how it determines. Is it, is it one of those situations where you get to be the tank and you get taken down and it's like, oh, I didn't even get to really try being the tank? Well, it's going to be really hard for them to kill you really quickly as the tank. Yeah. Because just part of you know that character is that you can absorb a lot. You have a lot of hit points. Okay. And you're very powerful. You can pick up like stones and rocks and throw them at people. If you hit someone, you're going to send them flying like 30 or 50 feet in the air. And so it's going to take them a few seconds to even get oriented where they're at. And if you're in certain areas like rooftops, <laughs> we were playing... Building. We were playing on the, you know, the end of No Mercy. You're basically on a rooftop trying to fend off people until a helicopter hits and a tank hit, like, shows up. If he hits you in the right spot, you'll go flying off the roof and you're dead. Like he, he just sends you right off the roof. Although you know that time we lived, he actually saved us because we were like – so like – I have to give. I'll give him this. Like the the but like when the AI director triggers a full on c- crazy zombie rush, it is insane yeah. the number of zombies that come at you and it disorienting. Is. And like, and, it do, and it's panic. not just it's not just for us. No, like the pan, like uh, uh, well, yeah, you do panic, but like so the panic doesn't set in like right away. It's like builds and builds and builds, and you realize like you're 15 seconds into a rush, and there's like more I mean, is it dead rising levels of zombies. I mean, I've not really spent. Oh, I, no, I would say beyond beyond in that they're coming not at, by sheer numbers, not by sheer numbers, but they're all coming at, at you once. And, and you're in more confined spaces. Yeah, you're in yeah, more confined yeah, yeah. spaces. So we're up on top of that. We're like trying to defend the top of that. Uh, control room where you mm-hmm. called from and there's like a mounted gun and like Dave is, is trying to cover my back or whatever and finally the tank gets up there and like we we're overrun we we're completely overrun and the tank smacks me and he smacks me so far that he actually knocks me all the way out of trouble far enough that I can stop bandage myself and run back over <laughs> and like start helping and start helping like clear away the zombies my, my favorite part of that one is uh, actually two things one time I was playing with Ryan on that level and we were just getting destroyed because we were playing on advanced I, and I will say the difficulty leap between normal and advanced is kind of it's kind of annoying because it it's not terribly difficult when you're playing with four people on normal it's kind of easy and specifically on console the advance is really really hard especially at the end of each of these uh, campaigns mm-hmm. And so we were getting killed a lot. And this one time downstairs in that area, there's like a closet. And I said, Ryan, we should just leave. Uh, we were playing with the end guy and one of his friends. And we said, we should just leave them outside. We're just going to go hide in the closet and let them die. And we'll just hang out in the closet. They won't know we're here. And so we, we hopped in. I've been out to them. And about 30 seconds into it, the zombies heard us. And oh, they start shit. beating at the door. And then they start ripping pieces of the door off. And you can just see there's like 50 or 60 zombies right outside. And then all of a sudden, the door comes down. And they just <laughs> rush <laughs> on the closet. And we lasted maybe 10, 15 seconds. It was That's terrifying. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but then last night, when we finally made it to the end, the helicopter goes down. We're all 
really low on health. We're limping, so you move slower. And you're like dragging your leg across. And, you're and, like, your, head, Shit, and your head's kind of bobbing when you're limping. So we're all like hobbling over there, trying to get to the helicopter. Garnet gets on. I get on. And just as the AI guys were trying to get on, a hunter leaps right inside the helicopter, the helicopter on us, jumps on me, is slashing, and Garnet like, like pushes him out of the way. Pull the left trigger. Like, yeah. it's, like a, it's got like a, uh, like melee. a melee attack or whatever. And like, save your friend, left trigger. I was like, Pfft. And as he pushes him off, the AI guys get on, the helicopter takes off, and there's like 100 or 150 zombies underneath still clawing at it, jumping off the side of the building, trying to jump to the helicopter. It was That's the way it ends. It was like so ants. Awesome. It, was, it was really awesome. Yeah, I, pl- I played at PAX, and they had, like, for, for press, they had, like, it was this weird, like, long, flat thing. Like, it was like a trailer almost. Yeah, and yeah. so they had, like, on one side was the, um, you know, like, they had screens on one side and screens on the other side for, you know, the people milling around. And then they had the middle part that so was enclosed. Like you had to go in a door, and just like they, and it was four people sitting next to each other on the screens and just like screaming and laughing <laughs> and just like it was so fun. Like I haven't seen that kind of like energy, like se- like sense of fun. In yeah, a, in a multiplayer. And, and, game. and I will say it's kind of a short game. You have four campaigns, and each campaign set up kind of like. A cheesy horror movie. The beginning of it, when it loads, it has everyone in this like poster, and it gives, poster it, gives your, it gives your gamer tag as Francis, as Lewis, or whatever. And they always have cheesy, awesome taglines underneath them. And then when you the Punisher, and then when you beat the campaign, it actually has uh, credits, which basically give you all the statistics. And what I found out, Scooter and I were playing with AI characters, and we actually just let them die, and because they were out in the open. And when our, the boat showed up to save us in one of the campaigns, we just let them die. And at the end of it, it says dedicated it to uh, Bill and Lewis. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> awesome. That's hip. That's very hip. Okay, so, so I mean, I guess like the end of this conversation for me, and we and we can't solve this question right now. My my, my one concern is is if you get really into it, are you going to burn out on it? And what's the longevity for it? You know, I've played through the campaign three times, every single campaign, every single act, and I still want to play. I'm super eager so, to play it again. I mean, I'm super, but it super like, eager to play more but, of it. Like DLC is a is a big and, part yeah. of and, this and, thing, and, right? And, and before PAX, we actually went to Valve and got the chance to check it out and talk to them. And they said that on PC, obviously Valve has a great track record with Dude, PC, giving out tons of content. PC gamers and Left 4 Dead are in free. great shape. Yeah, for free. But the one thing they said that they are they have been working with Microsoft and they are going to try to make sure that. The content will not be released day and day on PC and Xbox 360, but that the 360 users who will unfortunately ha- probably have to pay for it unless Valve can count some kind of sponsorship will hopefully only have to wait like a week or two longer than the PC. Let's see if that actually happens. I'm kind of skeptical myself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it does, <laughs> this game's going to be an awesome investment. For well, the game, the game needs it. I mean, again, the PC PC players, you're in great shape. I mean, obviously you've had the support before, but and what's interesting is you've even seen people with the demo take kind of the base thing and drop zombies in counter-strike maps and team fortress, team fortress maps team and maps, the ai yeah. director you don't have to like you don't have to create spawn points or anything the ai director just does it and does it well so i mean people will probably be, able to be creating custom maps custom campaigns and stuff as well so oh, cool. pc is awesome. definitely the way to go with on this we'll, one we'll de dust with but zombies th- but 360 owners you're not getting screwed either it's an awesome experience on both platforms yeah i mean so dave and i were playing on 360 and we had a good time i mean I will. I will still. I you know. I'd so much like to play games just lounging on my couch that I'd still. I'll still probably play a lot on 360. I'll play it on PC, but I like playing on 360. All right, there you go. A lot of people like playing on 360 because uh, they have new 360s after last month. We got the NPDs. Stick around. We'll be right back with that on the other side. Right, we're back, and I will just quote the NPD. The October results are in. Video game industry grew an impressive 18% year over year in the first month of the critical fourth quarter. With 10 months under its belt, the video game industry is still poised to top $22 billion in uh, annual sales yeah. in stop, 2000. Stop, 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 stop. Uh. All right, so what stands out out of this stuff? <laughs> uh, what stands out? Mm, 803,000 units of that Wii. That would be the Wii. And actually, yeah, I mean, so hardware, it didn't take NPD to explain Jesus that. Christ. Having hardware in stock for the Wii, it's shot right back I, to the top. 
got into I, an, I got into an argument with a with a very unpleasant lady in Best Buy. I saw your note underneath the picture of your of your story. So John had a story on uh, what they play about how he he, t- he took a picture inside Best Buy of these stacks of the weed. It was it was it was like three or four deep and about five or six high. Yep. And like I mean, there must have been like a hundred weeds. Nice. And there were like just two taken <laughs> out. So and they're right by the check. The, you know, they have that kind of area where you pick everything up before you go into the weird checkout maze in Best Buy now. <laughs> so I just get my phone out and I click a picture and this woman comes up to me and she goes, we don't allow photos. I'm like, why? Because. And she looks at me and she goes, we just don't. I'm like, uh, what, so obviously what? she didn't know why. Are we nine? <laughs> <laughs> we don't allow photos, mister. What are you doing? Taking I'm like, so what are you going to do about the two I just took? You know? <laughs> So yeah, we are out there. I got one. I mean, I jokingly said. Did you play Galaxy yet? Uh, Did you turn it on yet, Garnet? Yes, <laughs> I turned it on. It's I on twenty four hours a day, John. You don't have to turn it on. It's no, you know what? I turned right. that. Sh- I could turn that shit off because I got sick of watching the blue light. Blue light. I'm like, yeah. fuck this. You blue can turn. Light. You can just turn the blue light off. Ah, screw it. I don't want to attach so it. So it, no- it has nothing to do anyway. I can turn it on. It'll sync up. What I thought was very interesting about this is that it, uh, the rank order of platforms goes Wii DS three sixty. PSP, yeah, yeah, PlayStation Three, yep. So uh, let's look at some of these things. I mean, so first of all, yes, the Wii at eight hundred was amazing, and then the DS coming in at almost five hundred thousand. So between the two, they're back up at like one point three million units of hardware the sold. The Wii itself crazy. outsold the three sixty, PS three, and PS two combined. Or that is shocking. <laughs> Good God, it's just <laughs> when wow. you when you see it on paper like that, it's just. It's, it's kind of amazing, isn't it? So, uh, but one thing that also is differentiating things here is that the 360 price drop definitely. I mean, we can joke about it for, and especially in the hardcore community, we talk about not having the hard drive. How many of these people? I wish I knew. I wish we had a breakdown of how many people are buying arcades, and how many bought ones with hard drives. Mm. Because 300, 370 thousand units is. I mean, that's not a bad number. Mm-mm. It's not a bad number at all, especially not when your PS3 competition's back to 190. I mean. Yeah, I mean, we'll have to see how it shakes out the rest of the year. Did you get the? Do you have a printout of the Sony Rara note that they send out on the PD day? <laughs> you know what? Actually, I didn't about how they're all. so much better than they used to be, and that they know, it's uh, not really, it, look. It's not as bad as you might think. That that note. Well, yeah, you know what? So there were two things to that note. First of all, they said that they were better. they were up fifty seven percent from last year. You kind of have to be. Okay, and then the other thing was that they went back to they went back to using very heavily the terminology of PlayStation brand, oh. where they're where they're incorporating. Well, when you add the three of them together, it's quite a lot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they're taking advantage of the PlayStation brand terminology. When you add the three of them together, it's almost as much as the Xbox 360. Yeah. It's a lot more. It's almost as much as the DS. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's true. <laughs> I mean, hardware sales are scary. I mean, you know, like we had a story uh, earlier this week that Kama, that Kama Sutra had originally done on where they talked to Pactor. I mean, you know, everybody talks to Pactor. And we, you can debate how much value to put into what he talks about. But one thing that he said that I think a lot of people will agree is that the hardware sales are going to be a very good barometer for the health of the industry this fall. Yeah. Well, and what this says is people don't like expensive stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I think it'll be interesting. If this trend continues, how long before PS3 has to make a serious decision about what they do price price? And it has to wise? because I think a lot of people now are looking at some of the PS3 products and going, I really want that. I just can't justify the yeah. box. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I hear that a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's like they want to play Little Big Planet. They want to play, and they want to play because, you know, some of the third party stuff does look, you know, really, really nice on PS3. Oh, and absolutely. Think, yeah, absolutely. And the Blu ray aspect of it, but they're looking at it and it's just like, I just can't drop. They've got to get the hardware in people's hands. And they can't let they can't let 360 go back and broaden its lead again. I mean, here you've got a, a month where they've added another 180,000 to their to their separation between 360 and PS3. They've got to get back in the, they got to get back on top of well, that. Well, it's nearly two to one. I mean, it's, it's getting there. Uh, well, well, and they've got to get back to gaining because they started off a year behind. So now it's a year behind and they're still losing ground. They've got to get back. They've got to get in front of that curve. Um, Software-wise, uh, first of all, I think the Fable 2, they've got to be like pleased as punch with 790,000. Like, number one position, 790,000 units sold. Yeah, they had a good long run during the month, but that's... But it wasn't that long. That's the thing. I mean, I was... That's my sort of, like, beef with this list and saying, like, what was the best-selling game of the month? Because games don't all come out on the same day. Right. right? And, I mean, you're talking... Well, um, October 08 is October of the year. 
Well, right, but still. I mean, He's still, talking about if it comes out at the end of the month, like last yeah. week or two, versus a game that was already out at the beginning of the month. Okay, well, I mean... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, so you're talking... I mean, because, you know, like Dead Space came out much earlier in the month than some of the other ones, even though it has, you know, unfortunately the lowest well, number. Little Big, Little Big Planet did... 215,000 units in, what, three days? It came out the 28th. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it w- and and it had a delay and it had all that mess. Yeah. And, I oh, mean, totally. that's pretty impressive. And, you, you know, Fable 2 didn't come out until the 21st. It did, it did do really well. It I did mean, really that's, well. that's 10 days. It did, you know, 790K. That's really impressive. But let's look at what those 803,000 Wii owners yeah. bought with their Wii. They bought, guess what? Wii, Wii Fit, Fit Mario Kart, Kart. Wii Play. <laughs> And you know what's interesting, though, is those all come with a peripheral. Yeah. Each one of those comes with a peripheral. The, nin- the Nintendo dairy is in full effect. Well, they, and you know, the other thing that's really interesting looking at this is, you know, every other game on the list came out this month, and mm-hmm. those all came out at the beginning of the year. Yeah. That's true. That's impressive. I mean, Multi- you say what you want. So based on like, that, do you think that Animal Crossing will do well because it comes with the, the, point, the pointless thing? But it thing? doesn't come with it. Only yeah. a few places are selling a bundle. It's actually separate. Most of it's oh, separate. Oh, really? It's separate? Yep. And you better buy that peripheral new. You better buy that peripheral new. We have that story coming up. Yeah, we got What that. I think is interesting, if you look at SOCOM, I think those are actually pretty good numbers for P- PS3 specifically. For a PS3 SOCOM game? And that's what, fantastic. But, and the fact that like we don't know how many of those were it's well, this downloads. Is, this is just no, this retail. Is a, yeah, this right, is, that's what I'm is, saying. There was a bunch that's of others saying, as well. Like, no, absolutely. Like If you add what inevitably like how many people download it through PSN, that number is probably significant, significantly higher. And I think that speaks to the like the legs and power of the SOCOM brand. Yeah, still. I bet, I bet well, all those. You know, I have to. I have to jump in here as like because you know we have a lot of SOCOM fans that listen. They always give us shit for not t- covering SOCOM enough. And they're like, oh, see, that's the proof. You should have been covering SOCOM. Well, I, bet, I mean, they said what the Burnout Paradise did twenty f- is the biggest download game, and it did twenty five thousand. So I bet there was you know another twenty thousand SOCOMs through At PSN, least. which puts which would put it to two fifty. Which probably puts, even more which than that, puts actually. it up with the Saint with Saints Row. Yeah. Don't you think more than that? Because I mean, it's an online game. It's specifically an online game. No, but time. Burnout only did twenty five, and but that, Burnout's it, not a specifically. Yeah, I know, but it's game. the biggest selling but I would, full I, price I, game I, so okay. far. Yeah, but I would say that it's so com- might have even sold more than Burnout because yeah. Burnout had been out in retail so long before they mm-hmm. brought it to, to digital distribution. And is anybody else surprised to see Saints Row 2? Oh my god, yes. I'm, not, I'm actually not. I mean, a lot of Xbox owners bought the original Saints Row and actually liked it. And by all accounts, this one's actually not bad. It's actually pretty well, it's good. Just, it's just interesting when you compare it to the rest of the things. No, that's that are true. On, it does you know, stick like, out. It sort of seems a little Especially bit when you look at Dead Space and you know how much people seem to love that game, like almost universally. But it's also very violent, very kind of horror based. So that I'd like to know. I'm a couple actually things. surprised to see that as low on the list as it is. I agree. I really because it's such an incredible game. Well, I'm really curious to see what the split is. I mean, again, multi-platform games are are winning the list on 360, but I'm wondering how much the PS3 is making an inroad on that because I thought I actually thought the Fallout 3 number would be bigger. I mean, if, if well, Fable now, 2 does 790 thousand, but Fallout 3 only does 375. Yeah, but you're talking a, you're talking a, a week difference in release or yeah, yeah, a yeah week but how much in release like, dates on a hardcore a game like that uh, isn't a significant portion of those early sales the like day one and day two purchases but yeah but you know, fallout 3 came out on the 28th it came out three so days like, before the end of the month and, and an rpg specifically is not going to have the same first second third day sales as like a right. gears 2 yeah i think i, I think fallout oh, i don't know dude i think there were a lot of people i mean fallout 3 had midnight launches it, it did but I, I don't know i think uh, and also there's a lot of people that probably just bought it pc and possibly just bought it on steam well that's what i'm wondering and obviously I'm, I those think, numbers never I, show up i think right. they actually did do so i think no, they I, obviously I, did seriously do so. i think the the big fallout month will be next month because i think and I think, yeah. and I think it'll do consistently well because yeah. oblivion had long legs as well but i mean selling. look at that for three day for a three-day launch that's yeah. a decent really good number yeah it's a really really good number also note to sony you're only two games in the top 10 were exclusives you yeah, maybe do some more of that. And I guess a note to EA, <laughs> NBA Live, not competing all that well with NBA 2K9. We don't know where it, if it, where it that, is. That really, well, I don't know. Further down the list. But, like, I mean, I review 2K9. I think it's, you know, really good. 2K, the 2K basketball game's always been the better one, right? But EA put a lot of effort and actually made the game significantly better this year. Month, month before, Rock Band 2, uh, and now there's no Rock Band 2 here. And then also significant in his absence is, where's Guitar Hero? Yeah, I'm really surprised about that. 
I mean, think say. about think about the number of NPDs. Maybe two hundred dollars is a lot of money to drop on a game. Well, I mean, I guess you could. You, I, typically, the NPD has consolidated SKU reports. You know, for instance, on Fable Two, they talk about how they had the limited and collectors and mm-hmm. the regular editions all together. Well, Same there thing. were four editions of both games. Tons right? of different editions. I'd like yeah. to know what the how they reported on them because I'm really stunned that the Guitar Hero is not in here. I mean, I'm really surprised by that. Maybe there's musical instrument game fatigue starting to set in. Well, I mean, I think, when, you, when you have Wii Play, why do you need Guitar Hero? You mean Wii... Or Wii Music. Shut fuck. Up. Well, I, I fail at trolling. Wii Music also not on here. Well, I, th- I think that... Uh, I, yeah, I think December is going to be the big... The great equalizer for really? like, all of these things that came out. Well, yeah, because, I mean, look at December. Where there's not really a ton of big Prince stuff. Prince of Persia is like the last big name. Yeah, that's yeah. like the last big title. And then, you, but, you know, November... Where, or, or, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, October was just jam-packed. In the so you're kind of saying, see who's carrying through, who's really carrying the numbers. The through. holidays. Yeah, this be doesn't the include, like, so many people wait until late November, early December. Well, I say November will have that. I mean, November will really yeah. have that strength. Everything will be out, basically, by, well, everything is out now, really. Well, it'll have some of that strength, but I'm, but I think a lot of it's going to show up in, in, obviously, in Christmas and holiday sales. Yeah. You know? yeah, I mean, remember, Need for Speed's not out yet, and that'll do, over the course of its life, will do millions. Um, That's true. And you played Need for Speed. I'm anxious to play Speed. Really? Yeah. You really think it'll do millions? The, oh, yeah. They haven't done less than six million on the last really? five of them, yeah. God, that's surprising. <sighs> but it does release on, like, nine SKUs I, at I, a time, which yeah, kind of helps. Oh, yeah, all combined, yeah. And I'd be interested to see, too, what the numbers are like once, like, DLC starts coming out for some of these things. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that's going to help Fallout have legs, is releasing DLC for a 360 and PC. Dog armor. <laughs> Dog armor that you pay for. Dog armor that you pay for. Um, all right, so let's move right along. Moving, moving along. Uh, other best-selling lists we have. Uh, the NPD now does that uh, worldwide global bestseller list where they do it with uh, Enterbrain and then the GFK chat tra- chart track service out of Europe. And for quarter three, Madden uh, just t- just dominated, even over Wii Fit. I mean, granted, Wii also Fit there was interesting that the. the all but 40,000 units United States. was United States, really whereas shows. every other game on the list w- was a pretty respectable split across the three territories. Yeah, well, uh, we, we, fit, we Fit still was pretty strong in America as well. So anyway, uh, Madden, 3 million copies basically sold in the United States and nothing anywhere else. The 35,000 in the U.K. <laughs> Well, 35 you mean Madden in Espanol wasn't a big success? <laughs> El oh, actually, it probably was. Probably well, was they count success. that as a North American, uh, yeah, North American I don't number, think. Right? It had an offensive lineman on the cover. I don't think they put a lot of effort into that. I thought it was interesting. I, we'll argue about that another time. Anyway, Madden, and it definitely showed the strength of the US, U.S. market. Um, the only one that's the other side of that, though, John, is number four was Pokemon Platinum, which was only for sale in Japan. There you know, no no sales at all in the United States or United Kingdom. And it came in at $1.4 million. So, I mean, I guess if you have Pokemon in the name of a game, it could still carry Japan. But otherwise... Somehow it can still... still- uh, the Force Unleashed was number three with uh, 1.4 million in the United States and 300,000 in the UK. <laughs> we Fit was number We Fit was number two, selling pretty well in the UK, uh, well in Japan and the United States. Um, and then Mario Kart really well balanced down. Yeah, the there were places five. online selling We Fit for over 200 bucks. <laughs> Jeez! Wow! Because you still can't walk into a store and buy it very often. <sighs> no, that's true. It's a shame. Um, you know, I had a story today that I put up or, uh, on Thursday, which would be yesterday, about a survey that Microsoft's around. I mean, I think it's really funny to see the video game companies now trying to spin the recession as, like, a good thing for video games. Recession? It's great for video games because people stay home and they play video games. Oh, this so, is essentially the Microsoft staycation yes. justification. Exactly. So they had this they had a, they had this survey company. I'm supposed to do this, run this survey. And it was it's so funny because they, like, basically tell you everything that everybody has been saying already, which is people are not going to spend as much money this fall. And they they're don't going, want to go out. They don't want to go out, and they're going to stay home. So I lifted out some of the uh, funny things they found. They found that uh, 20% of the people surveyed said they sit around with their families over the holidays with nothing to do. <laughs> and also, <laughs> people, like, like my life. people like to watch movies. Yeah. And isn't it awesome that you can watch movies on your Xbox 360? Yes. Well, there you go. 86% of young adults hope to get at least one game as a gift this Christmas. How awesome. I think it's so funny, though, that Kids they Kids want video games for wants, Christmas? That's Young, adult, young adults like video games. Who knew? Wow, it's a good know, thing they paid money for the survey. Yeah, really. So it, it's so funny. I think it just really cracks me up that they, they turn to statistical analysis to prove that you need to buy an X, but Xbox 360 and Lips. That's what I, I, I would that, say, though, there is some precedence for lips, video. Not as sucky as... 
If Patrick Lepic is to be believed. And uh, James Milky. Yeah. He's been talking about it a little bit. Seems to be enjoying it. Loves to get his karaoke on. Yeah. Is there still room for just a karaoke only game, though? I don't know. I know a lot of women that are very excited about SingStar ABBA. My nieces would be really into it. Yeah, it's, it's the entire. Oh, I know a lot of gay 40. guys who are yeah. really excited about it's, it's <laughs> the, it's the, I mean, this is what no, they should have done from the beginning. Is thing. themed. I mean, like, I think rock bands nailing this as well by doing these themed, <laughs> themed music games. But it's basically the entire gold album as SingStar. I mean, it's like if ever, anything was ever going to appeal to like specific audiences that are very broad, it's, yes. it's that they should have done it ages ago. So after looking at the uh, quarter three results for. Madden, hold on to your hats because Epic Games uh, has announced that over the opening weekend, Gears of War 2 sold over 2 million units. <laughs> opening weekend, 2 million units, ba-boom. And, and over 1.5 million people logged into Xbox Live over the weekend. I mean, holy crap. Holy crap. Yeah. I'd say that's not, it actually doesn't surprise me. Doesn't surprise me either. I mean, the original Gears is still one of the most played games on Xbox Live every week. Yeah, as broken as it is, I I just I, th- that is an astounding number to me. I mean, that's really that's a pretty astounding number. If you're if you're a third party, I mean, it's no wonder that I think we we go back to that thing we originally talked about. PS3 has to get hardware in people's hands because in order to have those numbers, you have to have install base. In order for them someone to bring out a game like that on PS3, they have to have the install base. Like they like a Metal Gear Solid game should be able to do the same thing at retail, but without having the hardware basic just can't oh yeah well I mean, that's that's why i think that we're not going to see as good of numbers for a little big planet as we should be seeing yeah even if it yeah even if it has long legs that just i mean it's, sell a, it into? it's a stellar game it's yeah. just, it's stellar from one end to the other and i and it's it's a shame that it won't get but with the not being 199 version of the ps3 it's not it's not a hey. I'm going to go buy a PS3 and Little Big Planet. Because right, well, exactly. See, and and I I think if the, if the hardware was cheaper, you would see a lot of that. Yeah, because combined with tax, that's over five hundred dollars. Right. We uh, we had some strong words for Activision Blizzard CEO Bobby Kotick last week. Um, this week we have word from him. He was at a London. Uh, Lich King launch event where he spoke with VideoGamer.com and they asked him about StarCraft 2 and whether or not as he, you know, last week we talked about how he had said that they were interested in franchises that had that they could come back to on an annual basis and so they kind of expanded on that and said so is that the reason that StarCraft 2 is coming in three different versions so that you can exploit it for the money and keep, you know, and keep selling us a new copy every year or whatever and he says no, the fact of the matter is absolutely positively untrue about us trying to stretch it out and milk it <laughs> <laughs> People think that it was a monetary-driven decision. I can absolutely, positively tell you with 100% certainty that that was not part of the conversation. It'll be the following three that we do that on. <laughs> I, guarantee, I guarantee it. Uh, I give my word. There was never, ever a conversation. Stop me when I sound like I'm like you know begging for you to take me back home after you throw me out of the house. <laughs> I'm actually going to back him up on this. I was at BlizzCon this year when they announced it, and we talked to Rob Pardo about it. And it definitely seemed like it was a decision that came from the team. And they've already, they've already said like the amount of missions in the campaign, like the initial campaign, will be equal to what was in StarCraft 1. So you're not getting, they're not cheaping you out on the amount of content you're getting. As a matter of fact, the sole reason we did it was because we thought it was going to be a better experience. Anybody that says otherwise is not correct. It's absolutely not what we did it for. <laughs> All right. Then. Dude, well, who am I to argue with that? Okay. Well, in that case, it was a pretty big denial, dude. It was a pretty. How about this? It was a pretty hardcore denial. I mean, I, we'll let, we'll see. It, obviously, if the game stands up for itself, then all will be forgotten, right? I mean, how StarCraft fans they will be willing to forget pretty quickly. Yeah, I don't know. I, as long I, as it's good. Yeah. As long as it's good, they'll be willing. It was to good at BlizzCon. Uh, and there's been a lot of, speaking of buying games, there's been a lot of backlash uh, that we've been talking about with this season on secondhand game market. Uh, and people are taking more and more steps to combat that. Nintendo, as David mentioned, is going to be taking a step with the uh, w- with the We Speak peripheral. Well, where it comes with, so the We Speak peripheral is the little uh, puck that will sit on your television. Speaker phone kind of. Speaker phone sort of adapter, right? No camera, but where you'll be able to talk you to you have it. to start balancing a pile of things on top of your television I now. know. God, i got so much <laughs> crap sitting on my TV. And my TV's only this wide at the top. It's like, it's true. Geez. It's Jenga vision. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, th- it's going to come with a card that has a 16-digit code. This is, like, this is like what we're starting to see all over the place. We saw this with the Gears of War stuff. Saw so with NBA Live. Saw so with NBA Live, where the, where the DNA is also done by code. So now the, the way they're going to combine all this is... What does the Gears code, code do? Uh, you get the five uh, Gears 1 maps they remade for Gears 2, and you can only get them by buying new copies of the game. 
Yeah. Oh. Was it's it in the manual? Uh, yeah, you, yeah, there's a little card. A little card that oh, comes okay. with code. You peel off the little backing and then it Oh, shows. like the live button card? Yeah, and exactly. they've, they've said you're never going to be able to buy these maps. You're only ever going to be able to get them by buying the game new. So, so same thing with this peripheral. If for some, like when you get it, you'll have a card that comes with it that lets you get the speak channel where you'll be able to do the actual chatting over your Wii. And if you get one of these without one of these cards, you're shit out of luck because they're not even going to sell the channel by itself. They're not even going to sell the channel, so there's no way to ever resell this device. Once you have it, you have it on your console, it's yours, that's that. If you're a third-party developer that wants to have a game with voice chat, isn't this going to annoy you a bit? Um, well, why would why? It? Because you know, might why? have people buy without even realizing it, and they won't be able to use it on the game. By what? I mean, the, oh, you mean people, be, somebody, somebody just going out and buying it used and right. not realizing it. And not, not realizing it, and then they'll probably complain to the people that made the game that I they don't can't think use so. It. I mean, because you, will you need the Wii Speak channel to be able to talk in game for third party games or just first uh, yeah, party? Yeah, that's the real question. I that, think that's the key question. That is not answered here, but it does imply that you would need it to chat while you're in Animal Crossing. I mean, I think that I think they're very much trying to lock the device to that chat channel. So. Right. Who knows? Well, I, I still think they're making a big mistake by not bundling it with Animal Crossing. Well, they are bundling it. Well, I mean, some places. Right. They ha- they're, they're offering but it. Yeah, given, like, given their attitude towards, you know, the games we talked about earlier on, you know, only by Mario, Mario Kart only comes with, there's no non-wheel version of Mario Kart, Right. right? That you would Wait, think... If isn't it, there? I don't, I don't no. know. I've never I, seen one. Really? It comes with, yeah. That's interesting. I didn't really know that after launch, but they had told us like repeated times before launch that there you would be able to buy it without the wheel. Hmm. I've never seen it I've without. never seen it either. But you would think that... You know, there would be similar behavior with this. That the pr- predominantly, especially since you would you would see the sixty dollar version of, it, of Animal Crossing. Especially since it doesn't look like they put a lot of R and D into the graphics to the game of Animal Crossing. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's the, the same DS one, game, right? Well, it kind of looks like the DS game ported to the Wii. Well, it looks like the GameCube, DS game looks DS, like the game. I mean, right. but that's that's part of the appeal of that game. You say so. Well, no. I'm I to, to people who like it, that's mm-hmm. part of the appeal for them is the, is, the, is the look of it. I mean, it's got a distinct style. And that's what I mean. That's why I agree with them. That's on that why one. that's why AA did what they did with My Sims Kingdom because it's yeah. I mean it's a right. it's trying to tap into that Animal Crossing Very vibe, much trying to hit the same exact same vibe. On the subject of used games, though, probably the most controversial thing that's come out in a <laughs> long, I don't long time. Think he's going to have a lot of interviews in the future. Mike Caps, yeah. So Mike Caps of Epic Games, and, it, and it, he doesn't say that it's his suggestion. First of all, if you look at the quote carefully, he says, "I've talked to some developers who are saying." <laughs> quote, if you want to fight the final boss, you go online and you pay like 20 bucks. But if you bought the retail version, you got it for free. <laughs> so he wants, he wants to suggest that if you're, if you bought a used game, that the game wouldn't have the final ending in it or whatever. And then you'd have to like, you know, buy the final encounter from DLC to make sure that everybody who played the game paid something for it. Oh, see comments like this push me into the pro used game column. That's ridiculous. You don't have people like buying used cars, but you have to buy the steering wheel separately if you buy a used car versus a don't new car. Don't give him any ideas, David. Well, but the thing too is like, well then, and well then, how do you start differentiating like what's okay to buy used and what's not okay to buy used? It's like, so what if I want a copy of this game that's out of print, and now I'm going to be told I can't buy it because we're not selling secondhand and games. And the anymore. only person that gets screwed is the consumer. Well, right. See, like I mean, just you know, there, I mean, there's some things that you don't, you know, like. Um, I mean, for people who, who, who like that sort of thing, I mean, there's like, you know, like Atlas titles are usually only out for a limited amount yep. of time. Yeah. And, you know, like once it's done, it's done. And then you, if you don't like Odin Sphere, I bought used because I couldn't find a new copy anywhere. And what happens if, you know, the... They the, turn the servers off where you can't download exactly. it. Exactly. The, the, the publisher goes out of business and isn't supporting it anymore. And you've yeah. got a copy of the game and it's... Yeah. There's a lot I think, of... I think it was as much a articulation of the degree of frustration as... And I think if you... I don't think it was inter- a legitimately real success. And if you read the interview as a whole, it's somewhat taking it out of taking yeah. it out of context. Although I will say that there's, I mean, I mean, Caps was obviously very animated on the subject because he says in another part of it, he says we don't make any money when someone rents it, and we don't make any money when someone buys it used. Way more than twice as many people played Gears than bought it. And wait a minute, as many people as bought Gears, I mean, we know how huge the sales numbers for that. If way more than twice as many people bought but as bought it played it, the number of people that played Gears would be astounding. I mean, it would be. It, that's it would be ridiculous. 
like, I, I mean, I don't know the numbers on the leaderboard and like how many people. So have he's anti rental too. Oh, he's anti rental. Yeah, he's anti all of that. Uh, he says, uh, he says that he basically the only thing he loves is Steam. He says, I know that day. Not only do I get the check that day for all the games that I sold, but we also sold twenty eight copies of UT in Poland yesterday. We're able to respond immediately. <laughs> that model is so wonderful from a developer perspective. I know where my customers are coming from and how to keep them happy. Um, well, unlocking I, final bosses is not a way to keep your customers happy. Yeah. yeah. I, did, I understand. I appreciate the frustration. I th- still think that the rental I think added value brings I think, a lot of value into the I business. think what they did with Gears 2, and I think adding value to buying a new, get new game versus used is the way to go. Not taking content away. Right, because there's a... I mean, you, you can live without the maps. Yeah. Right. Well, the other thing, too, is that, you know... what. It, sh- I just lost my train of thought. There you go. Uh, well, I think that's ironic that's coming the bottle. from. I think it's ironic coming from <laughs> Epic because Epic has been so good with Unreal at, keep, at keeping to del- and continuing to deliver the sort of DLC that oftentimes free with the Unreal packs. They kept you wanting to keep the game, so you didn't trade it in, so you didn't take it back. It's the same thing. And the next news story we have is on burnout. It's the same thing the burnout teams are doing. You keep people engaged. I mean, there will be people this fall buying Burnout, a game several months old, because there's great content out there, there's great buzz around the game, people are talking about it, it's still a fantastic game. That is how you maintain well, they'll a game. Definitely, I mean, and uh, people that haven't, I mean, that the Burnout bumper party pack or whatever they're calling it, that is the new version yeah. that has everything, including the jet car and the party mode. And How awesome does that look, by the way? So, it's pretty uh, fucking rad. There's, uh, they're bringing the, uh, they're bringing the, basically their version of the Back to the Future DeLorean. It's, the, like you said, it's the beginning of flying. Yeah, it's, it's the beginning it's, of it's flying. It's a step towards the plane. This game is insane. Uh, it's so awesome. It's a pla- I mean, it's, it's becoming a platform now, which is fantastic. And is, I'd be interested to see if they start to expand the map. Yeah. I Do mean, they've they have the capability? They've, yeah, they, they've said they have. They, they were talking about it. there being a new island or something mm-hmm. and that they would expand the, 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 the game world out. And they would, I mean, you know, they've, they've shown that they can adapt. I mean, and they've. So Burnout Paradise becomes the world of Warcraft of car games. Yeah. I mean, and, I mean, that's and what we're the new about. packs they've talked to, it sounds like the, uh, the party pack you're going to pay for. Um, I don't know if the cars, this next round of cars, is pay for it. The part, Hold the on, part, I threw it over there. Let me look. The, um, the party pack, though, it completely changes the UI again. Like, totally new game modes, totally new challenges, the way that it, you know, the, the way that it communicates with you through the UI in the game. I mean, it, they're overhauling it, like, every three months right now. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's going to cost money. And actually, interesting, it's going to be part of what... Um, what Criterion is calling their legendary Oh, there's car four packs. cars. So in addition, they'll have the Cavalry Bootlegger, the Manhattan Spirit. So let's, let's guess what the, these are going to be. The okay. Bootlegger, General Lee. Jimmy, mm-hmm. General Lee, absolutely. The Manhattan Spirit. What would that Men be? in Black car. Maybe. Men in Black car. That punch, flies. Punch, the, with the flies, right. Yeah. Punch the, the button. Batmobile. <laughs> and then the GT Nighthawk. That sounds the, like Batmobile. 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 Yeah, that could be Batmobile. Batmobile or Knight Rider. Oh yeah. Oh, Night Rider. Real Night Rider, <laughs> not horrible modern yeah. new oh, Night Rider. Ghastly Mustang. <laughs> oh. All right. So there you go. Oh, so I just I remembered what I was going to say earlier. Sure. Uh, just to chime in, so I don't sound like a total idiot for people who are listening. But um, I, just, you know, I think that uh, you know they shouldn't downplay the strength of rental games because I'm sure that there's a fair amount of people who rent a game and then go out and buy the game yes. because they liked what they played. I was talking play. to the Gamefly guys and they were saying that the, the one of the, the preferred paths for people to buy is they is they rent it when it... They get, get it in the queue so they can rent it the day it comes out mm-hmm. and then essentially they are able to buy it as a used game. Mm-hmm. So um, you get it. It's a way to get the game cheaper but you're still paying your monthly fee to Gamefly and you get to pick up a game that essentially only you've played for like $30 instead of 50 and if they do that a lot, they keep ordering the games in. I mean, it's not like... It's not, it's like, not like they're not buying games. It's not right. like your local video library where they get 20 copies of something and then that's it, you know? Yeah, I... I, I, yeah, I mean, we've had this argument a bunch of times on the show. I think that the used game market brings a lot, keeps brings and keeps a lot of people in gaming, and then they buy more games. And the and the rental business, especially, I mean, the rental business keeps people renting games, playing games. The rental companies buy the games. People, especially like you said, the GameFly model, what, they for, buy for the games game out of that out stock. At a time, at, I mean, like the special offer right now is like eight bucks or something. I think with GameFly, that's <laughs> I fantastic. I mean, like if you you know if you play a lot of games. You blast through a game a week. Yeah. 
So the next thing that we have coming up is there's two games out right now that are specifically causing a stir in copyright law, and that would be Guitar Hero World Tour and Little Big Planet, because both of them have user generated content, and both of them have people that immediately, as soon as they get the game, generating content that is reflective of other people's copyrighted materials. Reflective? How about ripped off? Oh, <laughs> it's just, it's really, well, call okay. it. but so the interesting part is I thought that one of the, the, the songs that were specifically disappearing from Guitar Hero World Tour, at least the ones we pulled up for the story, were were all video game related songs. Have, oh, you, heard anything about, have you heard anything about the uh, like the well, someone is like Mario, Mario, theme, Mario right? theme, Legend Pokemon, of Zelda. Mega Man, like uh, Final Fantasy stuff. The Portal theme had been recreated, and those are all disappearing. But I didn't see anything about, and I haven't trudged. Did the Portal theme go? On oh, no, the Portal theme, probably went because there's an official version well, in an official Rock Band. Band right? Yeah, so right. maybe that's what it is. Um, and then, of course, then the little Big Planet levels started disappearing, and then. So what does that mean for? Um, the Mirror's Edge level that there was just a video that came out. Do you see that one? Mm-hmm. Someone, someone yeah, recreated. The ba- it was in the beta. Yeah, a little big planet. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. it's that's EA's property technically. Right. Well, see, I actually had I had wondered that like the first time I ever played the beta, I was like because of course there was like fifty Mario level one mm-hmm. ones. Yeah, and I was just like, God, can't you come up with something original? Let's <laughs> make something I haven't seen before. Well, yeah. I was talking to. To Garnet about this earlier, and that's kind of the natural order of user-generated content. Is initially so much of it is just retreaded stuff that's come before, and then ultimately people will build off of that before. And it takes a while to come up with your own unique concepts. And mm-hmm. so I think initially it always well, yeah, very has often rip-offs. deconstructing something else is the is you the learn. path to to making something great, right? So uh, Sony has actually given some information through video gaming 24-7 from from their Europe side um, that says basically they're committed, committed to continually improving their moderation procedure, in particular regarding the reasons that user complaints are upheld. And David, you and I were talking about this. Like, So from what I understand so far, they have such a flood of material that they're not they're not actively in there searching for levels. They're using the user report so if you system flag it. to go in and look at the stuff that's flagged. And that, that, that's also good for them because it really kind of isolates, you know, insulates them from any accusations so of playing favorites. Do they explain if it... it can, so like the Mirror's Edge thing doesn't use any Mirror's Edge assets. It's just... Right. It's just evocative. Take, it's evocative of it. And I think these Mario things, I mean, they're not really using Mario assets. It's right. just... Some rec- of them are. Really? They're lifting... Because yeah. they so use the camera. Is it, is it lifting... the camera, yeah. Is it lifting graphics? Well, there's been some Typically. Interesting. Interesting thing about the camera is there's some there's there's a little you know there's been a little back and forth on that on that issue is that I understand it that little, that the developers have built in the capability to take image files that are imported like off of a USB stick mm-hmm. or a memory mm-hmm. card and well, put was, them into the game. Well, there was video on yeah, that they, site with it. And, it. and it was going to be done, but now Sony says that that functionality is not going to be in the game, period. I mean, because they, of the copyright stuff? Up, well, they didn't say because of the copyright stuff. So I, I, think I want you to clear. buy a PlayStation Eye. I think it's pretty clear <laughs> that that would be what it would be for. Of course, it doesn't make any sense if you can take a picture of something with the eye. What the hell is the difference whether you do it high-res or low-res? As a matter of fact, it just hurts the artists who want to make high-res art on their own and put it in the game. Anyway, right. real quickly, they said that a couple of things that their moderation process right now is not perfect and they need to work on that and we've i mean they obviously that's an understatement the fact they don't have like a dedicated community team whether it's on sony side or media molecule side is yeah i mean like right now you have one guy who's like sack boy and then they've got some people like in some room somewhere who are moderating this stuff then that's not very transparent what what was confusing to me and i think you explained it was that if I create a level and I happen to take a picture of one thing that's copy has copyrighted, and then someone and it just has that one picture, the rest of the level is completely unique. Once I publish it, it uploads to the servers, and it no longer lives on my hard drive unless See, unless I go in and copy it. And, I need to build levels because I've been playing levels. Right. I think, and, but what oh, as I so understand fun. is what I understand is that yeah, people who are having their levels deleted had lost their work. But there's been a workaround. I mean, already people have like talked about okay, so if you have a level that you're going to post, here's how to move it into it. Here's how to copy it and keep a backup of it on your drive so you can like you know redo it with whatever the offensive piece was out of it. They said that right now. Here's their warnings or their advice. It says number one, make sure that keep all your contents like family friendly because everybody has access to your level if you publish it. And the second part is don't use images, brands, or logos that you're not entitled to use. Well, something I think that, and that I asked when I first saw uh, that this was happening was I'm a little uh, perplexed why they didn't include something where you could upload a level that was only available to your friends list. 
like I really think they should have included that. Yeah, like mm. a private level. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, well, I mean, because there's a couple of other, there's some other games that do stuff like that with these. Like you can make it just a uh, you know, like I think like that Buzz Quiz TV. Right. You can make quizzes that are only yeah. available to people on your I, list. I think honestly, they still weren't quite sure. They just wanted to make sure that the pool of levels was as wide as possible, and this would have that would have restricted it. And well, yeah, but I mean, I, just, I, I would like, you know, if they're really committed to continuing to like like add, add stuff, I'd love that. That'd be a great patch. I think that'd be really smart. Speaking of patches, Microsoft is getting ready to take off the uh, water wings and maybe go all the way into the deep end of the pool because they'd like to sell PC games online. Haven't they been doing this for ages that, already? Well, d- not not full games. Yeah, they, they have. They've oh, been selling are, them, and then they ship the physical games. discs to you and install yeah. it at home. No, you could download no, you, Age of Empires, right? Uh, no, I don't think you can download. But you can do. You could download like the like Zuma and. Oh well, yeah, you've been able to do that. But I could have sworn there was no, a. I don't think so. It was. I mean, it looked really old school. But you've been able to download stuff from their online store for a while. I don't think so. It just looks sexier now. It just, well, it does look sexier. So they added a new skin to the uh, Games for Windows Live. And, and then the Marketplace is an app, right? And they brought on Marketplace as an app. Yes, that's a very... Well, not just that, but you also will be able, be able to access Marketplace on Xbox.com as well to even buy content there for your mm-hmm. 360. And it automatically push it through your and, system uh, and turn it on. The new app runs in the background and it does but content, content updates for Games for Windows games and stuff. It's right? sort of right. Steam. Sort it's of, but sort of steam. But it's, sort of, well, that's what really. I said. They're still shallow in, but they're in taking a, off the water wings. I mean, they're getting ready to get in the pool because you actually cannot buy games yet. Seriously, you can't buy games yet. So they're going to add support. They're going to add support in a few weeks for demos, videos, and DLC through Marketplace. But what they still they, don't have that. What what it's funny to now? me that this is the front end. Okay, so they added the front end of the Marketplace now, which I don't even know what you can. You can't even really do anything with it. I guess. At this so point. why would I want it? Because it looks sexy, and you're going to be able to get you, know, de- you can be able to get DLC and movies and videos. You know what's sad? What's sad is Fallout Three, which is a Games for Windows title. The only way you can buy it digitally online is through Steam. <laughs> yeah, that's really strange. <laughs> Wow, that's awesome, actually. <laughs> um, uh, in an interview with Shaq News, the Games for Windows Live general manager, Chris Early, told uh, Shaq News, when we, when we get to the place where we do distribute games digitally, we will, ha- will we have a digital rights management system? I don't know. So we think, so it doesn't sound like it's coming anytime soon. Well, and then he goes on to talk about whether or not they're going to invent their own digital rights management system or go with the industry standard or whatever. But he does say that you know, when we get to that point, I don't know. It's, it's like live anywhere. Mm. <laughs> Microsoft initiatives on the on the chair, throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks. <laughs> that is really what they do, isn't it? It's really kind of a shame. Hey, GFW Live, uh, live anywhere says hi. How you doing? Yeah, I'm, 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 you know what I'm doing right now? I'm editing my Forza <laughs> Two card on my phone. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Jay? Uh, what else we do? Microsoft banned some 360s from Live for uh, being modded. Big surprise. You know what's weird about this is that they waited until after Gears 2 launched to, to do this. Because I, I had Gears 2 early and I was playing it online. And th- there were, I checked the leaderboard, there were at least six or 7,000 people that were actively playing online. And you have to think 99.99% of those were modded systems mm-hmm. with pirated versions. Oh, sure. And these people don't, didn't care. I was actually talking to them. I was like, do you guys not care about getting banned? And one guy was like, shit, I make plenty of money. I'll buy another 360. So I asked him, are you hiring? Because he's got a lot of money if he can afford a new <laughs> system. But like, it was shocking. They didn't care. But like, were Fourth they... chair is always next. That's what they say, right? <laughs> what, I w- what, I was, what I was asking was, like, why didn't they ban them before the game launched? Were they just using it as a form of kind of beta test to see how the networking shit would work before it launched? Because it was working just fine. Um, maybe they wanted to see how many they could rope in before they closed the net. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know how that community is. I mean, once 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 the word gets out that they're after those people, then people you know flip their switch to turn off their turn off their. No, they figure out how to know. circumvent it again and yeah. then continue to. Pirate. But this is all they did. What do you mean all they did? Well, this banning is, them. This is several thousand people. With stolen copies, and all they did was ban the devices. Well, I mean, what else are they going to do? Kick them yeah. off live and ban them. Well, you well they have prosecute the, them. They, they, yeah, they can prosecute them. They have their email address, their address. Their, they have all. I mean, if you have a live member and you're playing online, they know everything about you. Yeah, but the the expense is probably not worth it to them. Yeah, I, I mean, saying. if someone wants to mod a system, they still have to buy a system. Yeah. So, well, I mean, now I. Uh, is it okay to talk, talk about rules, the other then. pirate thing? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's a great pirate. Bring it in. So, uh, okay. 
I read this story today, and uh, I actually wrote something about it myself because I was so infuriated. Yeah. Um, the world of goo is reporting a 90% pirate rate, pirating of the, rate. Of the PC version? On the, of the PC version of the game. 90%? 90%. Yeah. And I just... And that game so deserves getting the support from well, people. Yes, I mean, I mean, this was, this was not a big company. This was put together by two guys who I happen to know personally, and are both really great guys. And so, of course, this subject, you know, is a little stickier for me because I know them, and I'm, you know, I'm, you know, support them. And to hear that, especially when you see games like Spore, games like Bioshock, who get reamed up one side and down the other because they have DRM. And, you know, I'm not saying I agree with the way that DRM is currently being handled. You know, I think maybe it could be handled differently. But, you know, you get these people, these people who are uh, anti-DRM who are saying, oh, well, I pirate games because they put DRM on them. And if they didn't, then I wouldn't. And I'm just doing it as a protest or whatever. And then you see, you know, actually... um, uh, Ron and Kyle made a conscious decision not to have any kind of copyright protection on there because they figured, okay, we'll do this as a show of faith. Like we're not going to put any DRM, and we, you know, expect uh, it's interesting. You know, every t- you know, the the people will support us for that, and then it's perfectly obvious that people didn't. Well, what I would ask is like, they obviously had projections of what they wanted to sell the game pre-launch. How do those numbers match compared to the ten percent who obviously were buying it? That I don't know. Yeah. But I wonder what the difference is between but them and Stardock. Right. Because Brad Wardell, you know, who you've talked to before, who runs Stardock, they've had great luck. Mm-hmm. And as a matter of fact, attribute a lot of their success and goodwill in the business in the PC side of the sector right now to not but having DRM. Irrespective of what they, I mean, anyone that's doing their first thing has, you know, you have no, you have what you hope and dream it's going right. to do. But then right. with something like World of Goo, I know people that have bought World of Goo on all three platforms it's currently available. Oh, on, yeah, yeah. Because they're so enamored by it. I mean, it's a really charming game. Mm-hmm. And. It's the kind of thing that should have snowballed beyond their expectations. You know, it should have been, they should have thought, hey, if we do 20,000 copies of it, then, you know, fantastic. But it, it, it's resonated with people. And there's so much love for the game that the fact that it, it's probably being played by hundreds of thousands of people, it's just so sad that. To, well, right. to be I mean, abused this way, uh, well, right, and it just it really shows. Uh, it, to, in my opinion, it shows a lot of these people who are, who say things like, you know, I, I only pirate things because, you know, as a protest, that they're that's, they're hypocrites. I mean, it's <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's and it's and it's perfectly, you know, you may disagree or disagree with the way that in DRM is set up right now. And like I said, there's a lot of parts of it that I don't agree with, but it almost seems like. If you want to, like, if you're an independent developer and you want to make some money off of your game, it's almost a necessity. Yeah. Or, or just go through Steam because right, they have their own right. encryption that's still. To I mean, knowledge, they said they're doing broken. really just well like, on. Follow my caps's instructions. Go through Steam. You know, they sell, the, sell the people in Poland. They're doing really well on Steam. They're doing really well on, uh, Direct on Wii, drive. and they're doing yeah on the places that they're selling it. They're doing well. But not as well as they would be if you know ninety percent piracy. It's just, it's appalling to me. Yeah. This, I mean, like right. I mean, every single person listening to this has access to a copy. It's out. It's PC, Mac, and Wii. So mm-hmm. it's like yes. you know, and it, it doesn't. It's not heavy on any kind of system. Requ- it runs no. on anything, and it's cheap. And it's, it's not dirt cheap. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah. So anyway, and everybody who's played it loves it. Yeah. yeah. Literally Absolutely. everybody who's played I, it loves uh, it. I had a hell of a lot of fun with it. So. All right, two quickies before we get out of here. First of all, uh, did did anybody here watch the uh, One Up Show last week with the Motor Storm interview? Because it's fucking yeah. awesome. Ali uh, Quinn, who did the interview for us, he did an awesome job with those guys. So he talked to uh, lead designer of Motor Storm, Nigel Kershaw, and the creative director Paul Hollywood. And in a nutshell, they uh, gave the scoop, confirming everything we always thought about that target render. Remember the very first target render of Motor Storm? We we're like, oh shit, that's really amazing. And then yeah. they were like, oh no, yeah. This so first of all, they said that uh, yeah, we, you know everybody doesn't render. They talk about how everybody doesn't render. Um, he said that at that 2005 Sony press conference where PlayStation 3 was unveiled, they actually uh, hadn't even seen the technical specifications for the PS3 yet. They were the, taking notes. That they were taking notes from the PowerPoint of what the PS3 was going to be able to do <laughs> and asking each other, uh, can we actually do that? And then they ran the video. <laughs> <laughs> 
And then wow. People kept asking if it was in game or whatever, and they'd been kind of like told to like skirt around it or whatever. So they didn't, they didn't, they didn't out and out deny it. And the company that did the video was called Real Time Video. So it was actually a real time video. Mm. <laughs> oh man! Wow, that that ouch! Yikes! Yeah. <laughs> it's a really good interview. Yeah, it was a really good interview. If you haven't watched the One Up Show from last week, you should go back and watch it just for that part because it's pretty, pretty crazy. And remember how much we joked about? Remember, remember the, the? Do you remember the Shane Sony Defense Force and how it was out? Oh, it's all gonna look like that. Hey, this is that was before I was in the industry, and I remember watching that and being like bullshit. Yeah, like I'll believe it when I see it. And so I think it's a testament to the most Storm team that they even approach the target video. Well, and with Pacific Rift, they get pretty damn close. Yeah, they do it. Yeah, the game, the game looks fantastic. Well, evidently they also got shit from Phil Harris. And later on in the development cycle, because they went on a tour, and Phil told them that they were the worst of a lot. And and, and on another note, it's like we recently <laughs> got builds of Killzone Two, and it, we can't talk about it specifically yet. But it is still shocking to me how close they've gotten that game to the original target render. Mm-hmm. Well, they had it last night, and it looks pretty damn good. Yeah, it really does look good, man. If that game had Call of Duty Four control sensitivity and tuning, oh my god, oh my god, it would be the mother of all shooters. Uh, I mean, then. <laughs> And last but not least, uh, hey, you know those guys at Rare? They must have been listening to the uproar from the interwebs because they're going to issue a patch within the next 30 days or so to uh, fix those standard definition television issues. You know? I'm still surprised that Capcom never did a fix for, uh, they never, for, Dead, for Rising, Dead Rising. Yeah. I mean, they like flatly refused. Yeah. It was kind of strange. Well, it's probably because they didn't have anybody who could write a great sentence like, it has come to our attention that people are experiencing subtitle readability issues with Banjo-Kazooie. Really? You mean like the fucking text is so small you can't see it at all? <laughs> <laughs> it's come to our attention. We didn't know about it ahead of time. Some of our notice. users' eyesight are less than optimal. Because we all have gigantic 1080p televisions and didn't notice. Anyway, yes. should have been done and ready for launch. Should have been in the damn code in the first place. Lesson learned, hopefully, you guys. Anyway, that's that. That's it. That's the whole deal. We're done. We're going to go check out some Prince of Persia, and then I guess we'll talk about that next week. Awesome. That'll be fantastic. So, Flynn, thanks for coming in, man. Thank you for having me. If we don't see you again before the holidays, happy holidays to you and yours and all and that. And to you. Maybe we'll see you again. What, what was that? I was just giving a tip of the cap. Oh, was tip, of the cap. Was tip of the cap. Tip of the cap. I don't know what you were doing there. I was like, that's David. Thanks for showing up and being jaunty. the new guy. Yeah, yeah good time. <laughs> it's, a Colbert. it's a Colbert thing. Uh. <laughs> Johnny, are you here this holidays? Are you huh? here this most of the rest of the holidays? Yeah, I'm here. You're stuck with me now. I hope. When, what day do you want to record Thanksgiving show? Maybe we'll do it like Tuesday or Wednesday beforehand. Tuesday. It's yeah. Tuesday. It's two weeks from now, right? Yeah, two weeks from now. So next week we'll have a regular show, and then we'll have a show. We'll have a show for Friday after Thanksgiving, and it'll be awesome. So until next week, oh, and jump in on uh, boards dot dot com if you want to do the gears thing. I'll yeah. be glad. I like this. Do you guys like this? I like more it. about the games. Like, I don't know. It feels feels right. It doesn't feel like we're forcing. Let's talk about the design theory of. No, they should be part of the conversation. Field of so. vision for first person shooters in the second segment. Yeah, we may never be able to go back. All right, thanks everyone. Till next week, we are ghosts.